I said I want to bring up some things from the last discussion we had. Oh, so you don't want to talk about the Quran and the Bible? Okay, go ahead. No, 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 I do. I just want to quickly go through this. Okay. Okay, yeah. So, like, last time, the only reason I brought up uh, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yeah. in the Bible is it's because of uh, there's a Quran verse, uh, 7, 157. Yep. And yeah, it says, and I understood that verse to mean that Muhammad uh, is still like in the Bible. Oh, yeah. That you guys have Jews and Christians. That's actually a verse yeah. we use to prove that the Quran testifies the Bible is not corrupt because it says the Torah and the Gospel with them. But see, this is the problem. Yeah. Let me tell you what the problem is before you ask. Because you think the Quran is the word of Allah and Muhammad is the true prophet. If the Quran says Muhammad is in the Torah and the Gospel, he's going to be there. If he's not there, that means the Bible's corrupt. No, that's reverse logic. If the Quran says Muhammad is mentioned in the Torah and the Gospel of the Jews and Christians at the time of Muhammad. And we have copies of the Torah and the Gospel. And we know what it looks like, showing that what we have today is what they read back then. And there is no prophecy of Muhammad. That's why we reject Muhammad. See, this is the thing. You're doing the reverse. Oh, Muhammad's not in the Bible. The Bible's corrupt. No, no, no. It's because Muhammad is not in the Bible. The Quran is false. You got it reversed. Yeah, but now I understood that verse differently. How? Like, okay. Uh, now I, I understood that verse as uh, as a, like a general statement because it says Torah and gospel. And yep. there's so many different kinds of gospels. There's so many different Christians with different uh, books and stuff. So Allah is addressing everyone, uh, everyone like all the Jewish and Christian people. What's He's the saying, Torah? That, uh, what's the Torah? Sorry, what's I personally, I think it's the Old Testament, the the books that you guys share with the Jews. So that is the Torah? I think so. Oh, good. All right. So because, yeah, because um, there, there are scholars like um, Ibn Taymiyyah that quote from Isaiah, I believe. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yep, yeah. the Salaf. And, oh, yeah, I'm aware. I wrote an article uh, where I showed, according to the Salaf, and Ibn Kathir mentions it, that the Salaf used the word Torah for the books of the two scriptures, the two testaments. So they didn't use Torah only for the books of Moses. I already know that. So so we agree on that. Yeah. And also I wanted to say that um there were many like rabbis during the time of the Prophet, like Abdullah ibn Salam and Kab al Ahbar, like they converted to Islam and that's because many? of prophecies in so Isaiah that, and Deuteronomy. That's many? Sorry, what's that? Many? You named two and that's many? From the thousands of Jews, two convert, no, that's many? No. no, I'm just saying there are many Jews, but these two are rabbis. Okay, like, so what about all the other rabbis that say he's not prophesied and that Isaiah 42 is about Israel? What about those uh, rabbis? Uh, that's like asking me, why do you have Jews becoming Buddhists or Hindus or atheists, or New Age, or Christians. So what do you do with all the thousands of Jews that believe in Jesus and believe that Jesus is the servant of Isaiah 42? Forget them. No, no, I, I, uh, I agree. Like, you built, like, a strong case for Jesus, but I'm just saying that there are Jews, like, yeah. during the prophet time that interpreted it differently. Yeah. But, That's assuming yeah. they believe, and assuming your sources are reliable, and not making it up. And secondly... How do you know the Jews converted out of sincere motives? How do you know they didn't convert in order to infiltrate Islam and deceive Muhammad and feed Muhammad information, which is why we find many of the rabbinic fairy tales in the Quran? Show me one. Chapter 5, verse 32. In fact, the whole story, if you read the whole story of 27 to 32, Cain and Abel, that's based on a Jewish myth that Muhammad heard God had garbled up and included it as revelation. And then even in 32, it tells you that what Muhammad is quoting oh, okay. was revealed to the children yeah. of Israel. And I'll give you the source. It's from the Mishnah. I have an article on it, but read it. Okay, show me. Well, read it first. Read 532. Okay, yeah, hold on. For that cause we decree for the children of Israel that whosoever killeth a human being for other than manslaughter or corruption in the earth, it shall be as if he had killed all mankind. And whoso saveth the life of one, it shall be as if he saved the life of all mankind. Okay, Unless so who did he reveal this to? 
he, he revealed to the children of Israel that okay. whoever killed a human being for other than manslaughter or corruption in the yeah. earth, okay. it shall be as if he had killed all of mankind. Here you go. Let me give you okay. the source. Here's the article. Okay. Here it is. Let me first get you the article. Here's the article, guys. And Lord willing, I'll try to remind myself to put this in the description box. Now let me show you the source where this came from. Because notice the Quran says, this was revealed not to your prophet, but to the children of Israel. Allah gave this revelation to the children of Israel. So it's telling you where to find this. You can't say it started with Muhammad. Muhammad was the first to quote unquote reveal it. It says, no, we revealed it to the children of Israel. Now I just sent you the link. Now let me get you the actual source. All right. Okay, sure. Let me get it for you. Hold on. All right, I probably gave you the wrong article. Yeah, I think I did. Hold on, man. Oh, boy. I got too many ar ar articles on this one. Second. Krishna. Yeah, the one, the one you sent is about an atonement or something. Yeah, yes, but it has 532 included, so I got to give you the Mishnah. Okay, five, uh, four, five. I got to find it. Hold on, buddy. Yeah, it's over here. So Mishnah, it should be here, but I couldn't find Oh, yeah, well, darn it. See, sometimes I can't even find my own stuff, buddy. Oh, here it goes. It's in that article. I was right. Here you go. Here's the link. Here's the link. All right. What I want you to do, I'm going to give you the link. You're going to read. It's too long, but yeah, you should read it. Here you go. Here it is. You're going to have to scroll down and read the English. This is where it comes from. This comes from the Mishnah. The Mishnah was written. Hundreds of years after the time of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is not found in the Torah of the Jews before or during the time of Christ. It is a tradition that the rabbis later wrote down as a commentary on Genesis chapter 4 verse 10. So if you go there, it's Mishnah Sanhedrin 4-5. Okay. Right there, you're going to see, and if you, it's a long one, but you're going to scroll down. To the point where you're going to see it says, Genesis 4.10, start around in case of capital law. You're going to have to look in for it. In cases of capital law. Read it out loud. testifies falsely. Okay. In cases of capital law, if one testifies falsely, the blood of the accused and the blood of his offspring that he did not dare to produce are ascribed to the witness's testimony until eternity. The proof for this is as we found the king who killed his brother, as it is stated concerning him. The voice of your brother's blood cries, cries out to you from the ground. The verse does not state your brother's blood in the singular, but rather your brother's blood in the plural. This serves to teach that the loss of both his brother's blood and the blood of his brother's offspring are ascribed to king. The Mishnah notes, alternatively, the phrase, your brother's blood, written in the plural, teaches that, that his blood was not gathered in one place, but was splattered on the trees and on the slopes. The court tells the witnesses, therefore, Adam, the first man, was created alone to teach you that, with regard to anyone who destroys one soul from the Jewish people, i.e. kills one Jew, the verse describes him blame as if he destroyed an entire world. Did you see where your Quran Adam... got it from? Yeah, I see it. Okay, say it again. Do you see? Because your voice is terrible for me. I can hardly hear you, barely hear you, but I don't know why your mic is like this. But you see, this is the Mishnah, where your Quran got this from, that if you kill one soul, it's like you're killing the whole world. It's a Jewish soul, but then finish it. Yeah, is my mic better now? No, it's not. I don't know what you need to do. Change your mic, change your computer, but it's terrible. But go ahead. Okay, so, yeah, no, I see it. I see the... Okay, the so, here's the thing. The Quran even admits this was not revealed to your prophet. We revealed it to the children of Israel. But the Mishnah is not inspired. It's not a writing written by prophets. It is a writing composed by rabbis centuries after Christ who rejected Jesus. Why is the Quran saying Allah gave revelation to those who rejected Jesus in a book that's not inspired? Um, would, would it still, like, don't, like, if Allah says 
uh, if Allah inspired the rabbis to write this, why would it be a problem? How can you inspire rabbis after Jesus when your prophet said, there is no prophet between me and Jesus, and inspiration is only given to prophets and messengers? Only messengers are given books. Okay, yeah, no, I see. So why is your Quran quoting this myth, this tradition, a fable as inspired revelation? Uh, um, you see, I, I noticed um, so, um, that sometimes the Quran uh, quotes like a Bible verse, but then like, like for example, I 43, it talks about um, the Jews coming to Muhammad uh, for judgment. And he says, why do you come to me when yeah. you have the Torah, right? But Muhammad, and in, uh, you didn't hear the verse. Yeah. It says, that's why we revealed to the children of Israel. It used the word revealed in 532. Yeah, yeah, I'm saying that. So, what if, like, this was originally in the Torah but was removed? But no, it was it's not the, the Torah. Weapons. There is no evidence it's in the Torah, none whatsoever, because the Quran tells us that Jesus confirmed the Torah in his day, and we have copies of the Torah at the time of Jesus, like the Dead Sea Scrolls, that do not have this rabbinic tradition. That's why I told you the rabbi said, they didn't say the prophet said. Okay, uh, uh, so uh, this uh, Dead Sea Scrolls, like how old is this? Is this the copies of the Old before? Testament are from 200 to 100 years before the time of Christ. And you okay, can so Google online is, and see the copies, the they're in Hebrew. Okay, so this is the Old Testament, like exactly the Old I Testament. I can't hear you. That we have right now? I can't hear you. Is this the Old Now better, yeah. Is this the Old Testament? Keep talking. The way you got your mic now, you're good. Yeah, yeah. so is the Dead Sea Scrolls like accurately like... Uh, yes, like it's, agrees, it's virtually preserved? identical to what we have today, yes. When you say, yes, it is. If I pick up Deuteronomy 34, it's going to read the same way I have today. If you're talking about variations, every copy of every book prior to the printing press has variations. So does the Quran. You know this, the 38 Arabic Qira'at, but anyway. My whole point is the variations don't give you a different text, a different theology, a different meaning. It's still basically the same message. Yes, and that's what Jesus confirmed. Okay, but um, there were books that are not part of the Old Testament. Is this, um, is this yeah. a verse found in that? Where no, because you just read. Did you? What did the rabbi say? This is in the Torah, or is this a commentary on the verse of the Torah? Did you read it? It's... Yeah, it's a commentary. Okay, yeah. so the rabbis it's, are telling you it's not Torah. Okay. So, but I'm asking you, why does the Quran say Allah revealed to rabbis who are not inspired, who oppose Jesus, rejected Jesus, and deny Jesus? The Quran says that these rabbis are like dumb asses. 62 verse 5 of the Quran. I have no idea. And then the Quran rebukes these rabbis for slandering the mother of Jesus and blaspheming Jesus. So how can they be inspired? I don't know. Yeah, that's exactly I mean, right. Just because, yeah, just because we, uh, we don't have evidence of this. But okay, my friend, no. we do have evidence. Number one, it says we revealed it to the children of Israel. Okay, so I go and look to yeah. the children of Israel, and I find it in the Mishnah, Mishnah, Sanhedrin. And I find it that the rabbis are saying this is not Torah, it's a commentary, it's a tafsir on the Torah. It's like you quoting Ibn Kathir and saying, Allah revealed to Ibn Kathir. No, that doesn't work. Allah didn't reveal anything to Ibn Kathir. Yeah. This is tafsir, commentary. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. So what's yeah, the next so point? I, what's that? What's the next point? You brought up this. Yeah, so my next point is that I want to bring up uh, Quran 279 to show that the, uh, Allah is aware of Jews, especially Jews, because in the context, it's talking to the children of Israel. So he's aware of uh, Jews distorting, the, I mean, like writing down uh, revelations and claiming. Yeah, I know. From You're going to quote to me and, chapter 2, verse 79, the verse we've responded to 5 million times. But yeah. That actually, 
that actually would confirm what I just said. The Quran is rebuking them for writing these kind of books like the Talmud, but it doesn't rebuke them for adding books to the Old Testament as God's word. That's not what 279 says. It says, woe to those who write with their hand a scripture saying it's from Allah when it's not from Allah in order for them to earn a miserable price thereby. And if you read the context, it's talking about a group of Jews at a certain time in history. It doesn't say all Jews everywhere. And even if it's referring to the Jews, the same Old Testament and the Christians. Can you show me where it says the Christians corrupted the Old Testament and wrote something with their hands and passed it off? Because even your commentators From, say that 279 is about the Jews. Yeah, no, I, I know it's about the Jews. But it's not so where do the Christians, Christians do that? No, I'm just saying that Allah is aware of the what you people of the book do with your books. Which people? He's aware of what you guys do. Wait, which people? You guys. No, that context is talking about a specific people at a specific location at the time Prophet. I wasn't there. What you guys? How's he talking okay. about me? Okay. Yeah, but weren't you Christians once Jews? And then not only that, can you read for me chapter 3, verse 113 to 114 of the Quran? Oh, I know this one. Yeah, well, read it. Because then it tells you they're okay. not all alike. There's a group of the people of the book that do not sell Allah's ayat for a miserable gain, but they recite it as the way it should be. Read that. 3, 113 to 114. Chapter 3, verse 113 to 114. They are not all alike. Of the people of the scripture, there's a staunch community who recite the revelations of Allah in the night season, falling prostrate before him. They believe in Allah in the last day and enjoy right conduct and forbid indecency and vie one another with one another in good words. These are of the righteous. Oh, so why did you quote a verse that says there's a small group that write a book that they say it's from Allah to make money off of it? But then the same Quran says there's another group that are righteous and upright and fear Allah and yeah. recite his ayat the way they should be and they will never sell them for a miserable gain. Why didn't you read that? Yeah, no, I no, I I, I know that the, like the Quran says that we should uh, not all like okay. the people of the book are the same. So what uh, you yeah, just I proved know. is there may be some copies that were corrupt, but the majority of copies are not corrupt because the copies of the Old Testament, New Testament. We're in the hands of millions of Jews and Christians all over the world. And at that time, they didn't have airplanes, internet, email. So they couldn't go throughout the whole world and collect all these copies in the hands of all these Christians and Jews and then corrupt them the same way and then make copies of those corrupted versions. That would be a miracle. Yeah, but... Um uh, Allah gives a test in 482 where he says if um, if this book, the Quran, was other, from, uh, other than from Allah, it will contain much contradiction. Well, there are many so contradictions. Why don't, you guys apply that, why don't you, you guys apply that test to your Bible? There's a many contradictions in your Quran. Your Allah. Quran is full of contradictions. Don't deceive yourself. That's not for Allah. No, it's, oh, I'll give you a couple right now. Okay, show me. Okay. Read chapter 2, verse 29 of the Quran for me. So oh, the Quran oh, fails its own test. I, um, okay. Sorry, what's that? The Quran fails its own test. It's full of contradictions. In fact, even before we go there, yeah. go to 482. Yeah. Go to 482. Yeah, yeah. You keep saying yeah, yeah, yeah but you're not we, there. Yeah, I know, but before we go there, can, can, can I, you? Can no, you we can't. The, no, before we go there, because if you show George B, <laughs> George B, his mother got beat by Shia because that whore was doing muta with the Shia, and they beat her like a dog. This is why George B. is a dog and a whore of the devil, and I piss on him, even though my piss is cleaner than his mother. But go ahead now, brother. Coming back to you, go to chapter 4, verse 82, because that verse itself shows the Quran is a lie. Okay, will they not then ponder on the Quran? If it had been from other than Allah, they would have found therein much incongruity. Okay, do you understand why this is a contradiction? How is this a contradiction? Okay. So Number one, it says, if it had been from other than Allah, in other words, if it wasn't Allah who wrote it, they would find many contradictions, right? So whoever wrote this verse doesn't know yes. logic. 
because that means only someone who is all knowing, i.e., God, can write a book free of contradictions. You got it? Because it said, had this been from other than Allah, they would find many contradictions. Logically, that means the author doesn't know logic. Because implication is, only God can write books that have no contradictions. Everyone else will make mistakes. So if I pick up a book on science and there are no mistakes, that means that Allah wrote it according to the logic of this verse. Second problem with this verse. So, well, there's another problem. Why did it say, had it been from other than Allah, they would find many contradictions. That means if I find a few contradictions, it's still from Allah, as long as I don't find many. Does that make sense? No, I think that's just like, like that's general, you know? Like, no, that's not what it says. You can't, Fred, you can't explain to me what the verse means when I'm reading it before my eyes. Had it been from other than Allah, if this book wasn't from Allah, they'd find many contradictions. Meaning, only Allah can write books that have no contradictions. Well, that means any book I pick up, if I pick up a book on history that's accurate, Allah wrote it. If I pick up a book on math that has no mistakes, Allah wrote it. If I pick up a book on science, no mistakes, Allah wrote it. That's the logic. That means whoever wrote this didn't know logic. But then it gets worse for you. It says, if it had not been from Allah, you'd find many contradictions. That means if I find few contradictions, it's still from Allah. So Allah can make a few mistakes, but not too many. That's the logic of the sentence. No, I think maybe the, when it says many contradictions, it's referring to uh, abrogated verses, maybe. Where? Where do you get that from? Why are you improving on the speech of Allah? Do you speak better than Allah and his messenger? <laughs> I mean, how am I going to try and get out of this? You put well, you don't. Them. The way you get out of it is leave Islam and give your life to Jesus. Why you keep fighting, kicking against the goats? But now, go to three seven, please. Go to chapter three verse seven. Okay, but before we go there, could you explain um, the Ibn Abbas's commentary on Q seventy nine, where he says that you yeah, I've already got an article on the bolt. I've already written on that. I will address it. I got an article on this. That's misreading Ibn Abbas because according to Bukhari. The same Ibn Abbas, the same Ibn Abbas said, yeah. none of the books of Allah can be corrupted. I'll show you that from Bukhari. But before I do that, before I do that, I'm going to explain Ibn Abbas hadith that Muslims like to misquote. And I'm going to show you that the same Bukhari on the authority of Ibn Abbas said that Ibn Abbas said the Torah and the gospel cannot be corrupted. What they changed was the meaning of the words, not the text. I'll show you. But before I do that, I promise you, we're going to get there. I have articles on it. Read chapter 3, verse 7. Okay. Is my mic uh, better? It was better, and then you lost it. So I don't know what you did. Keep doing it. Is it, is it better now? Mm -hmm. Keep going. Now, this good? one's going to be a problem because the Quran says there aren't contradictions. Well, explain this one for me. Chapter 3, verse 7. Okay. Okay. So he it is, he it is who has revealed the book to you. Some of its verses are decisive. They are the basis of the book, and others are allegorical. Then as for those in whose hearts there is perversity, they follow the part of it which is allegorical, seeking to mislead and seeking to give it their own interpretation. But none knows its interpretation except Allah. And those who are firmly rooted in knowledge say, we believe in it. It is all from our Lord. And none do mind except those having understanding. Okay, I need to ask you a question. The Quran says you have books that are clear, that are foundational. <clears throat> They are the mother of the book. It's Umul Kitab. Then you have sure. ambiguous, unclear verses. No one knows what they mean except Allah, right? That's right. Okay, so my question to you, where does the Quran tell you which verses are unclear, which verses are clear, so you know not to quote the unclear verses? Can you show me where the Quran tells you what are the unclear, ambiguous verses so that you know not to quote them and avoid them. And what are the clear verses? Um, it doesn't specify exactly, but I believe our prophet will uh, reveal this when the Quran Christian asked about the Holy Spirit. You'll be shocked because when you you're appealing to when you're appealing to the situation of Quran, it's, it's going to backfire against you. But you'll be shocked even in the hadith. 
you don't find a detailed list of what verses are unclear, so you don't quote them, and what verses are clear. And I'll come back to Najan because you mentioned them. But then can I ask you another question? Sure. What is the point and what is the wisdom of Allah revealing unclear verses that no one knows what they mean? Of what benefit will this serve you in your worship and daily life? How is this guidance to give you verses that no one knows what it means? Where Where is the logic in this? Okay. Yeah, Sam. Isn't the Bible filled with history that's like irrelevant? Like, what's the point of talking no, about No, you're, you're attacking straw man. No, no, no. You're lying now. History that's recorded is relevant because it actually happened and we learned from the past. That's not what the Quran says. There are verses that no one knows what they mean. How do you know those verses are about history? Are you adding to the words of Allah? Only Allah knows. So, why did Allah reveal verses? No one knows what they mean and therefore serve no benefit because it can't guide you. In fact, it's going to misguide you because you don't know which verse is unclear. So you'll be making the mistake of explaining an unclear verse. Why did Allah do that to you? Yeah, but didn't Allah also say that he could have made us all one community, but he, this life is a test that he, oh, like see. there are different communities. And he will judge between us on the day of judgment. We'll find out about these unclear verses on the day of judgment. Oh, so you just admit, I want everyone to hear, Allah deliberately designed to reveal unclear verses to misguide people to hell. Good job, Allah. And he's all merciful. Good job. I'm glad you admit that. No, I didn't say we're going to misguide to No, hell. you just I'm said just that. that you said Allah could have given us the guidance, but this is Allah's way of testing us. So how does he test us? By sending us verses that no one knows what they mean to cause people to stumble so he can damn them to hell. No, I never said damn them to hell. I just said that he's going to inform us of where we used to differ. Like about, Okay, but hold on. Like, Didn't you just say is. the verse? Wait, wait. The verse just said, those who focus on the unclear verses, they have a disease in their heart spreading fitna. So what's going to happen if you have a diseased heart and fitna? You're going to go to Jannah or you're going to go to the fire? Okay, yeah. Okay, yeah, I see it. Yeah, so see why it. is Allah sending verses that are unclear? No one knows what those verses are in order to cause people to then focus on verses that they think are clear and are not clear in order to damn them to hell. Like this bastard here who's got an Arabic name. He's saying I'm a fraud, but he can't defend his prophet because I'll bury him. Okay, but go ahead. Um, so can I'll you explain to, this like, contradiction? Yeah, no, I see it, but it's, I have to come back to him. I don't have an answer. Okay, now, you mentioned the Christians of Najan. I'm glad you did. I didn't mention them, you did. So you're admitting to everyone, you're admitting to anyone, everyone that the first 80 verses of chapter 3 were sent down to respond to the Christians of Najran, the Arabic-speaking Christians, and their debate with your prophet in Medina, right? Yeah, that that's a pretty, that's a, yeah. That's right. Okay, according to the commentators like Tabari and Ibn Kathir, this this verse, chapter seven, cha chapter three, verse seven. You know why it was given to refute the Christians? It has to do with the identity of the Holy Spirit. No, it has to do with the identity of Jesus. Hater, I love you, man. Uh, it has to do with the identity of Jesus because they told Muhammad, "Don't you say." That Isa is Kalimat Allah, the word of Allah, and the spirit of Allah, Ruh Allah. Yes. Then you prove he's divine, that he's God. And so the verse came down saying, those ayat about Jesus being the word of Allah and the spirit of Allah, those are unclear passages. No one knows what they mean except Allah. Don't focus on them. So can I ask you a question? Sure. Didn't Allah know that the Christians were going to use Muhammad's statements about Jesus being the word of Allah and the spirit of Allah like we do today to prove Jesus is God. So why did he wait until only after Muhammad was caught off guard and embarrassed by the Christians using those words against them to prove the divinity of Christ, leaving Muhammad silent, and then only then come up with the answer, oh, oh, oh I, I should have told you, those verses are unclear. Don't focus on that. Why didn't he? Before the Christians came, say, 
And these ayat about Jesus, no one knows what they mean except Allah. Don't focus on them. And then why re reveal those verses about Jesus if you don't want people to focus on them? I have no idea. Exactly. So you sure you want to use no contradiction? Because I'm, I, I have a field day, man. I can be here with dozens of contradictions that even your best scholars can't answer. But I want to yeah, show. Yeah, and Shabir has Shabir Ali has made a list of a hundred contradictions in your Bible. And then I have six part refutation to his lies. And why doesn't he respond to my list of contradictions to his Quran and debate me if he thinks he can refute? See, we've already refuted him. Why doesn't he refute us? Here, let me get you the links. And I don't think you want to use Shabir, who's now throwing the Muslim sources and the Hadith under the bus and deny that Adam is I historical. Yeah, I don't agree with uh, Shapir Ali, oh. but he's kind of deviant. But kind of but deviant. I'm just saying that. Kind no, of. He's pretty deviant. Say it again. That's what I'm on here. He's what? He's uh, he's a deviant Muslim, but uh, but that's uh, that's not the point. The point is like you have bigger problems. The no, I don't. We have. Like, have you read our answers? Or are you just parroting what you read from websites with no understanding? Have you read our, the answers? I've. Literally read the first chapters of Genesis and they contradict each other. Okay, they, you mean wait, 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 hold on, you got a problem. Uh, Muhammad, so you're, you're, you're going to now bury the Quran. You mean the same Genesis that the Quran says Jesus confirmed between his hands? So Jesus knew less than you and you're smarter than Jesus? Go to chapter yeah, 3, verse so 50. You just blasphemed Jesus. You no, just I'm insulted not, Jesus. I'm not blaspheming Jesus. Yes, you did. Because in chapter not, 3, I'm verse 50, you're not listening. Right. Chapter 3, verse 50, it says Jesus confirmed that Torah between his hands. And the only okay. Torah the Jews had I'm, is the Torah that has Genesis 1 or 2, which you just said is full of contradictions, means that you're smarter than Allah and Jesus because it's your God that inspired Jesus well, to confirm it. Love. Okay, well, read it. I read 350. That. Don't talk, okay. read. 350. And a, okay. And a verifier of that which is before me of the Torah, and that I may allow you part of that which has been forbidden to you. And I come to you with a sign from your Lord. Therefore, be careful of your duty to Allah. Okay, so me. Jesus verifies what? The Torah. Yeah, and literally in the Arabic, it's Mustadiqin Nima Baina Yadeya, between my hands. So can you prove to me that yeah, the Torah right. can you prove to me that the Torah of Jesus did not have Genesis 1 and 2? No, I can't prove it. So why is Jesus confirming I, I, Genesis 1 and 2 which is full of contradictions? So you mean your God Allah misled deceived Jesus? No, it's not from Allah. But hold on. That's the Torah he confirmed. Go to 546. Yeah. As we sent after them in their footsteps, Esau, son of Miriam, verifying what was before him of the Torah, and we gave him the Injil, in which was guidance and light, and verifying what was before it of Torah and a guidance, and an admonition for those who guard against evil. And now literally it says, Jesus came in the footsteps of the prophets before him who all used the Torah to judge. That's the context of 43 to 45. And literally the Arabic says, Musaddiqan, sadaqa, the verb to confirm as true, to bear witness as true. Min bayna yadehi, between his hands, min al Torah of the Torah. And then his gospel confirmed the Torah between his hands. So again, can you prove to me historically, give me one manuscript, a shred of historical evidence that the Torah that Jesus confirmed did not have Genesis 1 and 2, which you just attacked? I don't mean to attack the Bible. I, I, no, just give me you know, proof. I don't know much about Yeah, I, I can't give you the proof. So that the Torah have... of Jesus, and yes, the answer is yes, because we have the manuscript proof, the Dead Sea Scrolls, have Genesis 1 and 2? Yes. Yeah, I guess they have. So why did Allah have your Jesus, Isa, confirm it? Um, 
I don't know, but Muhammad also confirmed the Torah, which was with the Jews. Oh, good. So maybe and that confirmed. Torah had what? Yeah. The Old Testament. Yeah, but what? Did it have Genesis 1 and 2? Yes, it did. So why does Allah have your Muhammad and your Jesus confirm that Torah that had Genesis 1 and 2? And didn't you just admit Ibn Taymiyyah confirmed that the Torah is not corrupt? There are some scholars who admit that's not corrupt. Yeah, there were many different views in his day. Okay, so why did Ibn Taymiyyah agree that Torah that had Genesis 1 2 is not corrupt, which means he's stupid too? Okay, maybe well, uh, could it be that um, that uh, they're confirming the, the, the revelations in these books, not necessarily the, the false statements. And the Where does it qualify saying that Jesus only confirmed that which is sound and then exposed corruption to it? Don't add to the verses. You're doing the very thing you accuse Jews and Christians of, twisting, changing the words of the Quran from their places. You're doing the very thing. You just twisted the words of the Quran with your tongue. Show me that. Okay, let's talk about that. Okay, no, I can't show you that. Okay. I don't have Do you know that your Quran has a contradictory creation account? Since you wanted to attack Genesis, it's your Quran that contradicts the order that Allah created. Go to 229. Go to 229. Yeah. Read it for me. He it is who created for you all that is in the earth, and he directed himself to the heaven. So he made them complete seven heavens, and he knows all things. So what did he create again in 229? Read it again. He, yeah. Um, he created for you all that is in the earth, and then he directed himself then, to the thumma. heaven. So, thumma. And I'm going to prove to you thumma means sequential, contrary to liars like Jamal Barwi. Can I ask you a question? Can you show me and quote yep. one scientist, one, that says the things on earth were created before the heavens and that the heavens are seven? Quote me a reputable scientist that says that. Okay. Now go to 41 verses 9 to 12. Sorry, what, what, which verse? Chapter 41 verses 9 to 12. Okay. Uh, okay. So it says same. What do you indeed just believe in him who created the earth in two periods? And, do you and by the way, it doesn't say two periods, it says two days, but let's go with it, two periods. It's two days, but that's okay. Yeah, it is two days. Okay, so that is the Lord of the worlds. And he made it in mountains above its surface, and he blessed therein and made therein its foods in four periods. Okay, now before you move on, years. okay. He made the earth in two days. He made the mountains and the provisions of the earth in four days. Two plus four is six, isn't it? Yes. Okay, now pay attention to the language. You read 9 and 10. Read now. When you finish 10, read 11. Then he directed himself to the heaven, and it is a vapor. So he said to yeah. it. And, and to the, the word earth. is smoke. Come. We'll go with vapor. Before you move on, let's go with vapor. It's the word smoke. You can look at the Arabic. It's smoke. Then, Thumma, he turned his attention to the heaven when it was smoke. Your translation wants to sound scientific. Instead of days, it's periods. Instead of smoke, it's vapor. Okay, fine. I'll agree with it. Notice, when Allah created the earth and its nourishments and provisions in six periods, the heaven was still smoke, right? That's right. Okay, read it again. The heaven was still vapor smoke. Read 10. I mean 11, I'm sorry, 11. Then, then he directed himself to the heaven, and it is a vapor. So he said to it, and to the earth, come both willingly or unwillingly. They both said, become willingly. Now, did you see the earth is already in existence? Yeah, I see it. Okay, so you're, there's no tap dancing around us like these liars like Jamal Bari do. Notice when Allah turned to the heaven, the heaven was small, the earth was already there. Then notice verse 12, what he does. So he ordained them seven heavens in two, two periods and revealed in every heaven its affair. 
and we adore the lower heaven with brilliant stars and made it to guard. That is the decree of the mighty, the Lord. Okay, now watch what you just read. Then he turned to the heaven that was smoke, vapor, made it into seven heavens and two periods. So now, can I ask you a question? You just read the earth and all the provisions were already there, created, fashioned in six periods when the heaven was still smoke and vapor. That's what you just read. Then he turned to heaven and spoke to the earth and saying, earth and heaven, you got to come along with the heaven. Made the heaven in into seven heavens in two periods or two days. Two questions. Number one, how do you have the earth existing when there is no heaven or space for it to exist in? Which scientist thinks that the earth was already there, suspended, without heaven, without space, without place? Because the earth is in space. Here, the earth is outside of space because there's no heaven. It's a vapor. It's a smoke. But then secondly, do the math. That's eight days. Two days to create the earth. Four days to create its provisions, mountain. Then the heaven was still vapor, hadn't been created. And it took him two more days to create the heaven into seven heavens. That's eight days. But that contradicts the Quran in 754. It says Allah created the heavens and the earth in six days, six periods. Make up your mind for me. At 754? Yeah. Make up your mind for me. Sorry, your Lord is Allah who created the heavens and the earth in six periods. How many? Read it. I can't say it. Six no, I can't periods. Say it. I'll say it. Six periods, right? But then 41, 9 to 12, do math. Even my young daughters can do math. Two plus four plus two is eight. But then it gets worse. Because in 41, verses 9 to 12, it says, Earth was created, then the provisions like mountains, before the heaven, right? Heaven was still smoke, correct? Yeah. But now go to chapter 79 of the Quran, 27 to 33. 79, 27 to 33. Okay, are you the harder to create or the heaven? He made it. He raised high its height, then put it into a right good state. And he made dark its night and brought out its light. And the earth, he expanded it after that. After, wait, wait, wait. After that? After when? After the heavens. But 41 says the earth was created and its nourishments before the heaven. Make up your mind. Finish it. And the earth, he spread it after that. And then what did he create? The mountains, its nourishments. Contradicting 41 verses 9 to 12. Read it. He brought from it its water and its pasturage and the mountains. He made them for a provision for you and for your cattle. You confuse me because in 41, 9 to 10, it says that the mountain its provisions were already created when the heaven was still vapor. Here it says heaven was created, then the earth was spread with its nourishments. Which is it? Six days, eight days, earth first, or heaven, or heaven, and then the earth's provisions. Can the Quran make up its mind? And this is just some of many contradictions. See, unlike the Bible where your Quran says, you see, you are stuck. The Quran says Jesus confirmed Genesis and Muhammad confirmed Genesis. You're stuck because if you attack Genesis, then you can go the route of apostate prophet, become an atheist. But you can't attack the Bible. You're going to remain faithful to the Quran. But you can't remain faithful to the Quran because the Quran confirms the Bible and the Bible contradicts the Quran. So you can't remain a Muslim. If you agree with the Quran, the Bible is not corrupt. So you either give your life to Jesus or you become atheist and don't believe in any religion. Because you cannot, with a clear conscience, follow the Quran and attack the Bible. And you cannot, with a clear conscience, follow the Quran with all these contradictions and errors. You can't. So it's your choice. You can follow Jesus and be saved and experience his loving, transforming power. Or 
you can become like a apostate prophet and say, hey, I give up on all religion, which would be tragic, but that's your choice, dude. But you can't stay a Muslim. And I'll give you an example of what I mean. As a Christian, I can't attack the Old Testament. Why? Because my New Testament confirms the Old Testament as God's perfect word. So if a Jew attacks the New Testament, I'm stuck because I got to refute him, but I can't attack his Old Testament because that means I'm denying and betraying Jesus in the New Testament. However, you're in the same boat. You follow the Quran. You can't attack the Old or New Testaments because the Quran confirms them, whereas the Old and New Testaments contradict the Quran. So you are in a worse situation than me. I got to refute the Jews who attack the New Testament and convince them from the Old Testament, New Testament's true. You got to now convince us from Old and New Testament the Quran is true because you can't attack it any more than I can attack the Old Testament. I can't do it because then I'm contradicting the New Testament. So you can't either because then you're going against the Quran. But unlike you, I can see how the New and Old Testaments fit together. Whereas your Quran is contradicting Old Testament, let alone the New Testament, and you're stuck. So what are you going to do, buddy? Ooh. I can give you more contradictions, man, but it's up to you. You want me to give you a few more? Explain, explain the Ibn Abbas's commentary on oh, yeah, yeah. Well, you, you guys disturbed your bones. Sure. Okay? Even you if that's... About, yeah. Okay, okay. Even Let's go with that. Even if that's a statement from Ibn Abbas... All you're proving is a source that comes 200 years later has Ibn Abbas saying the Bible's corrupt. Okay, but did you just not admit for everyone here, renowned scholars like Ibn Taymiyyah said the Torah is not corrupt? Did you not just admit that? Yeah. Yeah. Say it again. Yes, I did admit So it. wait, didn't Ibn Taymiyyah know that statement from Ibn Abbas? Yeah, I'm sure he did. And he still said there are scholars on the basis of the Quran that say that the Torah is not corrupt? Yeah, because they used the hadith of our Prophet when he swore by the Torah. Oh, so Ibn Abbas is smarter than your Prophet. He swore by the Torah, but Ibn Abbas' statement is more authoritative than Muhammad. See what you did well, again? I'm just saying that. That hadith caused a lot of confusion, and maybe we're not understanding what our oh. prophet did. Like, so, so hold on. Yeah, the scholars I, who studied these sources thoroughly and didn't just appeal to that hadith. They also appealed to 6115, and Bukhari quoted it, right? Bukhari quotes yeah, Ibn Abbas, okay. right? Okay. Yeah, now let me show you what Bukhari also said. This is one of the statements. One of the statements that... <clears throat> That the scholars used to show the Bible is not corrupt. Okay, let me just find it. Here it is. I want to give you the link. Okay, Ibn Abbas. Okay, here you go. Click here. Bukhari. Sahil Bukhari. I'm going to read to you what he says. And he's the one who quotes Ibn Abbas, right? Yeah. Bukhari's the one who quotes Ibn Abbas saying, why do you ask the people of the book anything when they don't ask you anything? When you have the revelation coming fresh to you and they, on the other hand, distort their books, writing it with their hands and saying it is from Allah when it's not from Allah. That's what you're referring to. The yes, same Bukhari good. that quotes it. I just gave you the link. Can you click on it? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. We give you the Arabic and I give you the English translation from Aisha Buley. Aisha Buley. Let me get it for you. I'm going to give you the actual link from Aisha Buley. So you can read it with your own eyes. And if you read Arabic, it's right there. Okay? Okay. The words of Allah Almighty, Messenger, transmit what has been sent down to you from your Lord. If you do not do it, you will not have transmitted his message. You're as, the wrong one again, buddy. Said, Keep going to LV period space the... And it's going to take you to the subheading, the words of Allah Almighty. I don't know why you keep doing profit on me. I don't know what it is. You got a profit fetish? The words of Allah Almighty, it is indeed a glorious Quran preserved on a tablet. Keep going till you get there. L V period. The dot. Okay, I got it. I got it. You yeah. sure? So, yeah, I did. Okay. So, the words of Allah Almighty, it is indeed a glorious Quran preserved on a tablet. 
by the mount and an inscribed book. Kapara said that Mustur means written. Mustur means the inscribed. And the Um al Kitab is the whole of the Quran and its source. He said that Matal Fizu means he does not say anything but that is that it is written against him. Ibn Abbas said both good and evil are recorded. And Yuhara Funna, this is now tampering, changing the word Yuhara Funna in 446. Now notice the explanation. No one removes the words of one of the books of Allah Almighty, but they twist them, interpreting them improperly. Wait, 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 wait. Al Bukhari just quoted Ibn Abbas and works as a typo. It means words. She, she mis, uh, miswrote. Al Bukhari just quoted Ibn Abbas saying, No one removes the words of one of the books of Allah Almighty, but how do they twist them? Interpreting them improperly. The same Bukhari that quoted that hadith from Ibn Abbas, which you are misapplying to teach that Ibn Abbas taught the text was corrupted. The same Bukhari? Bukhari just quoted Ibn Abbas saying, No one can remove, change any of the words of Allah's books. They twist them. They remove them by misinterpreting them. Then you're going to quote this hadith instead of trying to understand it and this statement of Ibn Abbas and Muhammad's attitude because that's all you have. You don't have much. And if you read Arabic, do you read Arabic? Yeah, a little bit. Okay, well, if you go back to the main link, I give you the Arabic. You'll read it there in Arabic. Here it is. Just check okay. it out. Yeah, just give me a second. Yeah, let me yes. just send you the link again. Let me send you the link again. I'm just doing several things. Here it is. There you'll find the Arabic text of Bukhari. We give you a fresh translation of the Arabic on top. They corrupt the word means they alter or change its meaning, yet no one is able to change even a single word from any book of God. The meaning is that they interpret the word wrongly. And then you'll see the complete quotation in Arabic. We provide it right there. It shows us where we mistranslated when even Aisha Beauty translated it similarly. So Ibn Abbas is not your friend. If you read him in context, he's not saying they wrote a book with their hand and twisted the text, meaning the books of the Bible. He's saying they passed off forgeries that had nothing to do with the books that God sent down, the Torah and the Gospel. Because those books remain Intact, incorruptible. That's what Ibn Abbas believed if I read him in context. I even wrote an article on that explaining it. Here it is. And I'm pretty certain you're not shown this. Here. Did Ibn Abbas believe that the Holy Bible is corrupt? Here you go. I responded to these hadiths. There you go. Guys, I'll try to put these articles in the description box, Lord willing. Okay, so here you go. Save the articles, guys. Upload them, study them, understand them, use them, and translate them. Here it is for you. I wrote an article on this years ago. I already know this passage. But unlike the Muslims, I try to interpret your sources in context. It's ironic. You would think a Christian would want to twist your sources. It's you Muslims twisting your sources, choosing the things you like, ignoring the things that contradict you. It's we Christians Remind you, wait, 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 there's more to the story. What about these other verses? What about these other hadiths? Yeah, because because Allah accused you guys of being liars and deceivers. He did? You sure about that? What did he say about Christians in 582 and 83 and 57, 27? What does he say about Christians? Go to 582 and 83. You guys are liars. You call Jesus the Son of God. When okay, well, let's see if the Quran agrees with you. First, let's see if the Quran agrees we're liars or we are people of compassion and mercy and we are an upright people unlike the Jews that your Quran hates. Go to 582, 83. You start at 81. Okay, sure. If only they had believed in Allah, in the, in the Prophet, and in what happened. Chapter 5, verse today. 81 to 83. Yeah, yeah, I'm reading it. Okay, go ahead. And what had been revealed to him, never would they have taken no, him for friends and protectors. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm going to trust. But most of them are rebellious wrongdoers. 
strongest among men in enmity yes. to the believers will now find the Jews and pagans. And was, yeah, I know this works. Okay, but wait, what does it say about Christians that you just slandered us? That you guys are closest to us. And what are we? Read it. Read it. No, you stop. Don't stop. Don't yeah, you, you, you do attack yeah. the Jews, but what does your Quran say about Christians? Because amongst these are men devoted to learning and men who have renounced the world. But you just called us arrogant. liars, right? Yeah, it says amongst these men, not all no, of uh, yeah, no, oh, them. Yeah, no, but it didn't say you're misreading it. Stuck for Allah, Rabbil Alameen. Do I need to correct you? Let's read it again. Okay, thou will find the most vehement of mankind and hostility to those who believe to be the Jews and the idolaters. And thou will find the nearest of them in affection to those who believe, to those who say, lo, we are Christians. Those who say, you forgot that part. Then it says, because there's among them, some of them are monks and priests. Yes, not all of them. And because they are not proud. Why did you misquote it? See, you're doing the very thing the Quran slanderously and you slanderously accuse Christians. You Muslims twist your own Quran with your words. The very thing you accuse us, you just twisted the verse. It's talking about Christians in I general. Think that's not for Allah. I just quoted Yusuf Ali. That's not for Allah. I all right. Well, word. I don't know if Yusuf Ali, I'll blame him too. All right. Now keep reading all the way to 83. And when they hear what has been revealed, I'm really shook here now. Okay. And when they hear what has been revealed to the apostle, you will see their eyes overflowing with tears on the account of the truth that they recognize. They say, our oh Lord, we believe, so write us down with the witnesses of truth. Now, do you know the historical context of this? Uh, no. What, okay. what is it? Now, if you want, you want me to prove to you that the Muslims, like your prophet, were liars and deceivers? If you read the context, this is talking about the Najashi in Abyssinia, when a group of the Muslims went to Abyssinia to seek the protection of the Christian ruler. A group of pagans went after them to bring them back to punish them. The Najashi said, no, anyone who seeks my protection and asylum will be protected. So then they plotted. They said, all right, we're going to go tell Najashi and his bishops. They denied Jesus as God. This is your sources, not me. So they went to Najashi and saying they deny Jesus. So then they summoned. They summoned the Muslims, and again, if memory doesn't fail me, guys, real real quickly check. It says, Jafar ibn Abu Talib, I believe uh, Ali's brother. Again, I'm going by memory. Forgive me if I'm wrong. He said, I'll just recite to them chapter 19 of the Quran, chapter 19. And according to your sources, he narrated the story of Mary, 16. And how she gave birth to Jesus and Jesus speaking as an infant. But he stopped, he stopped where it says that Allah has no son. And then they said to him, we believe Jesus is Abdullah, slave of Allah, the virgin born son of Mary. The word of Allah cast down to Mary and the spirit from him. But they didn't tell him, we don't think he's the son of God. And they didn't tell him. That we deny he died on the cross for sinners. They deliberately held back those details in order to deceive the Christians into thinking the Muslims held the same view of Jesus so that Najashi wouldn't persecute them. So we're liars? You guys are damn liars. That's why the Christians started crying. Because when they heard the verses of chapter 19 of the Quran, 16, all the way 34, praising Jesus, being born of a virgin, honoring Mary. Of course they're going to cry. But they left out the rest of the story and the details. Why? Why did they do that? I can't say it. And you're saying we're the liars. Go now, 57-27. Sorry, then we made our apostles follow in their footsteps, and we sent Isa, son of Miriam, afterwards, and we gave him the Injil, and we put it in the hearts of those who followed him, kindness and mercy. And as for mockery, they innovated it. We did not prescribe it to them, only to seek Allah's pleasure, but they did not observe it, 
with its two observants, so we gave to those of them who believe their reward, and most of them are transgressors. Okay, so here where they transgress, they invented monasticism, but they failed to live up to it, and because of that, they're transgressors. But notice it says, we put in the hearts of Jesus' followers, what? Kindness and what? Mercy. Okay. Now, some of them went uh, overboard with monasticism. But notice why. It says, because they wanted to earn Allah's pleasure through being monks. But they fail, failed to live up to it. And because they did, they transgressed. They failed to honor the monastic life. But you put that aside. The followers of Jesus are known to be learned men. Known to have kindness and, and mercy in their hearts. And yet you're saying we're liars. Now go to 15, 90, 91, because I'm going to show you your Quran says your Quran is crooked. 15, 90, 91. Your Quran says your Quran is crooked. Like as we sent down on the dividers, those who made the Quran into shreds. They did what to your Quran? They shred the Quran. That doesn't mean it's corrupted. Of course sir. it doesn't mean that. Because, see, if that said it about the Bible, you would be throwing it in my face. See, those who shredded the Torah, those who shredded the gospel, aha, you see, the Quran says your Bible's corrupt. But it can't mean that because yeah, it says it about the Quran. Listen, if you shred one Quran, it doesn't mean you shred all Who of told the you it's shredding? What Quran? You're saying the unbelievers had copies of the Quran? It wasn't even collected in a book yet. Yeah, I... So how do they shred it? Whatever, whatever early copies they shred, that doesn't mean all the copies are shredded. Oh, okay. Notice your logic. Copies. Just because some copies were shredded doesn't mean the rest. But you don't apply that logic to the Bible where it has hundreds of thousands of manuscripts. You see? Well, not, let me not exaggerate. Around close to 30,000 manuscripts. Let me be careful. I don't want to. That was hyperbole. I was exaggerating. So we have nearly 30,000 copies of the Bible. When the Quran says people were shredding the Quran, even though it doesn't make any sense because the Quran wasn't compiled in a book, but let's argue it was. There were copies of the Quran, people shredded. That doesn't mean the Quran was completely corrupt, even though it says they shredded. But when you can't find anything similar that the Quran says about the Bible, you take certain verses out of context, see the whole Bible everywhere is corrupt. Why didn't you apply that same logic to the Bible? Just because some copies are corrupted, the other thousands of copies could not be corrupted the same way. We have nearly 30,000 copies of the different books of the Bible, buddy. How many do you have? Yeah, but because we, we know the Bible is corrupted. That's why we have to interpret Did Ibn Taymiyyah know that? Did Al-Bukhari know that? Did Ibn Jawziyah know that? Did they know that? Yeah, Did Ar-Razi know that? They can get things wrong. They Did Jesus know them. that when he confirmed the Torah in his hand? I don't know. So you know more than Jesus, Muhammad, Allah, no, and the ulama. Allah. No, you, you know more than Bukhari. Bukhari, who you believe was the greatest collector of sound hadith, whose collection, Sayyid Bukhari, is second to the Quran in terms of authority. He knows much less than your apologists and scholars today. Yeah, you're right. The guy didn't know what he's talking about. Yeah, I agree. No wonder Shabir Ali is becoming a munafiq. Because he's throwing all these sources on the bus like you do. You're doing the same thing. I didn't throw the sources. I just, I just got stumped. All right. At least you're honest. I got stumped. And speaking of which, do you really believe the stuff in Bukhari? Honestly? Honestly, do you believe it? I want to uh, know. As are you going to bring up the uh, Satan party during the Adan and stuff? Say what? I've heard you bring that up before. Say what? What did you say? You're gonna bring up those. You're gonna bring up those embarrassing hadiths where it's like Satan parting during. The okay, Ramadan. but that's what I'm saying. Like you, that. God has blessed you with intellect, wisdom, and the law written in your heart to convict you. Do you honestly, when you're alone, no one's watching you but God? When you read that, doesn't it bother you? That such statements are attributed to Muhammad. Like he, when he would eat food, food would praise Allah because he's about to eat it. Or he'd have a water sprinkler system coming out of his fingers. 
I mean, honestly, I'm just asking, honestly. And you're okay that Bukhari narrates a hadith that a group of monkeys were stoning a she monkey because she committed zinna, and then one of the Muslims helped them kill the she monkey for committing zinna, adultery. Really? You okay with that? So monkeys have sharia like us. So that monkeys get married and one monkey can commit adultery, which brings stoning as the punishment for, for adultery in the monkey world. I mean, it's up to you. You want to believe this. You really want to believe this religion? For what? You're fighting a losing battle. Honestly, you are. It's best you move on. My hope is you come to Jesus, who is alive, who is almighty, who loves you. But if you don't, remove the shackles of Islam. Be free to start thinking intellectually. Be free in your thinking. Because if you continue this process of honestly, earnestly seeking truth and seeking the true God, inevitably you'll come to Jesus. Maybe not now, maybe 20 years from now. Even former atheists who are Muslims. End up years later becoming Christian. I'll give you one example. Now, he's still not there fully. Still not there fully. But he's 90% there. Ali Sinna, who started Faith Freedom, was a staunch atheist. He's now at the point he believes God exists. There is an afterlife. We don't cease to exist. And Jesus is God. And he worships Jesus as God. But he still thinks the Bible is corrupt. So he's not there fully. But notice where he went from the 90s to now. He now believes Jesus is God. God is real. There is the afterlife, and atheism is irrational. So as he continues, he's going to now accept the Bible as God's word. His journey is not over. So why not give up on the shackles of Islam? Whether you like it or not, whether you like it or not, if you're honest with yourself, the Muslims in these Muslim countries, Taliban, these are not idiots. You know this. Many of them are highly educated, trained in Sharia, and know the Quran and the Sunnah inside and out. So though the Muslims here try to make them look like deviants and idiots, they are some of those brilliant Muslim scholars you meet. They know the Quran inside and out and can refute their toughest opponent. So don't deceive yourself. They know Islam. And if you keep going this path, then the demonization will be strong. You'll end up being like them, beheading people, slaughtering people, raping captive women, even if they're married, and even violating children in the name of Allah's messenger because that's Islam, whether you like it or not. Why? You just said your baby sister. I'm going to ask you a sincere question. I'm going to ask you a sincere question. Don't you dare. Don't you See? say anything Why? bad about her. Why? Why did it hurt you? Why I love her so much. Thank you. Then why doesn't your heart break for all those thousands of young girls because of 65 verse 4 in the Quran and the Bukhari and the commentators that allow men to marry girls who haven't reached puberty and have sex with them, destroying them physiologically, psychologically, emotionally. You would kill someone if they did it to your sister. I would do the same. I'd kill someone if they got near my, my daughters. Then how do you live with yourself when your prophet set the example that he did that? It's time for you to leave, man. It really is. This is why God brought you here and softened my heart towards you. He softened my heart towards you because God is crying out to you. And it's not Allah of Muhammad. It's Jesus, the son of God, who's saying, son, enough. Come home. Experience my rest and peace because I love you with an everlasting love, and only in me will you be secure forever. Stop fighting because you're going to lose, and I don't want you to lose because Jesus is in love with you, whether you believe it or not. He is. I don't believe it. I don't believe in the Bible. I don't believe in Jesus. Yes, but you do believe in the Quran and the Hadith that allows girls to be taken as brides and mounted. Why did you get angry then? If you're a true Muslim, then I, if a man... I was born a Muslim. I only started practicing about a year ago. So I didn't learn most of this stuff. Okay, now you Muslim. know. So let's... You don't believe in the Bible. Forget it. So you believe in the Quran and the Hadith and the Sunnah? 
So if you're faithful to Islam, what grounds do you have for not allowing someone to marry your sister when she's nine? You said you believe in the Quran and Sunnah. Just, we're just not. Say we're just don't do that stuff anymore. I can't hear you. We don't do that stuff anymore. Where did you get you don't do that? It's in the Quran. It hasn't been abrogated. And it's in all know, your I scholars. Say it again. It's I, it is in the Quran, but our uh, but the commentators say that the the girl has to like. like no, they uh, don't. The, those girls have, haven't menstruated. No, they don't. Uh, I have the scholars. I have the scholars. I have the hadith. I've written articles on it. No, they don't. What are you talking about, dude? Qurtubi, Qurtubi doesn't say that. Ibn Kathir doesn't say that. The two Jalas don't say that. Tabari doesn't say that. <clears throat> I mean, I can go on on Zabakshari, Baidawi, all of them. I'll mention, none of them say what you just said. What are you talking about? I have the article here. Let me get it to you. So unless you're embarrassed by Islam and you think the, the <clears throat> hakim, the, the judges of the kufar, they know better, right? The hikmah, the, the judgment of the kufar are better than sharia. You're stuck with this. So why did you get upset? You should be proud if you're a Muslim. Let me get you the article. No scholar. That, why do you think Shibrali is a deviant? Shibrali has read all this. Shibrali can't believe this anymore. So he rejects classical scholars. And I'll admit, classical scholars say that, but modern scholars. So you're saying for... These past 1,300 years, all these scholars were a bunch of idiots. And the hadiths attributed to your prophet are frauds. That's exactly what he believes. Because he's too embarrassed and won't defend us. Because he knows he can't defend us. Neither can you. So why are you trying? Here it is. Click on it, read. All the scholars are there. Guys, I gave you the link as well. All the scholars are there. You want me to go through some of them? You want me to read some of them? Yeah, sure. All right, here you go. Sal Bukhari. Sal Bukhari. Okay. Here goes. The tafsir of Surah Al Talaq. Mujahid said that if you have any doubt, 65 4 means if you do not know whether she menstruates or not. The idda of, a, of women who do, not, who do not longer menstruate, and now watch this, and those who have not yet menstruated. It's three months. This is Sahil Bukhari. And then guess what example Bukhari gives? Guess what example Bukhari gives? Here it is. Chapter, a man giving his young children in marriage. By, notice, young children. By the words of Allah, that also applies to those who have not yet menstruated. 65 verse 4. And he made the idda of a girl before puberty three months. You know Islam, idda is the waiting period for a woman who's divorced, three months. There is yeah, no idda right. waiting period if you haven't had sex with a girl. That's chapter 33, verse yeah. 49, right? That's right. Yeah. Here it says, Bukhari. He made the idda of a girl before puberty, three months. So wait, you mean you can marry a girl who hasn't had puberty and have sex with her and divorce her? Really? And you're yes. telling me, but you just told me, no, the scholars say, what scholars? And now here's his example, his example, 4840, same, this is the hadith that goes with this. It is related from Aisha, the prophet, married her when she was six years old and consummated it when she was nine and she was his wife for nine years. Sad Bukhari, chapter 70, book of marriage, English translation, Aisha Beulah, it's in my article. So what example? Your prophet's example. A man who's 54 years old married a nine-year-old and had sex with her. And he's your example. Enshrined in the Quran, it's never been changed. So are you okay with it? I can give you more, but I gave you the top, Bukhari. I can give you Ibn Hajar al-Askalani, his commentary on Bukhari. Are you okay with it? I don't know. Well, what I want you to I do tonight, here's what I want you to do tonight. I want you, 
look at your sister and see how in the world can I accept this? How in the world can I accept this? Young girls like this with grown men. This is from the pit of hell. It makes <coughs> Satan happy. No, you need to turn away from it. Now, if you, unless you want me to continue, I had two more examples of mistakes in the Quran. Let me give them to you, and then you can call me this week. We can talk about other things. I want to look, show you. I want to show you two more things from the Quran. Okay. The Quran claims repeatedly, in contradiction, chapter three, verse seven. The Quran claims repeatedly. I can give you the verses. You can find it in chapter six, verse six, verse one hundred fourteen. Chapter 6, verse 114, right? Chapter 10, yep. 10, verse 37. Chapter 10, verse 37. Chapter 12 of the Quran, verse 111. Chapter 12, verse 111, okay? Chapter 16, yep. verse 89. Chapter 16, verse 89. And chapter 41, verse 3. 41, 3. This is just some of many. Up until the point of chapter 3, verse 7, Muhammad kept saying, this is a book that explains its verses in details. It is a book that explains everything. Everything. Leaving nothing for someone else to come and explain. Okay, let's test it. Can you go to chapter 17, verse 1 for me? Okay, glory be to him who made a servant to go on the night from the sacred mosque to the remote mosque, of which we have blessed the precincts, so that we may show to him some of our signs. Surely he is the hearing, the seeing. Now, I'm going to have you read it slowly so you can see the problem. The Quran says it explains everything in detail, and its verses are explained in detail. That's 41 verse 3, if you don't believe me. Anyway, it says, Glory be to him who took his servant by night. Who's his servant? Muhammad. Where does the verse say that? Where does the verse say that? What's that? Where does the verse say it's Muhammad? We get that from outside of the Quran. Oh, so you just went outside of the Quran when the Quran says it explains everything in detail and explains its verses in detail. Okay, secondly. I don't, yeah, I don't fully understand how, yeah. Well, secondly, it says who took him from Masjid al Haram to Masjid al-Aqsa. Where is Masjid al-Haram? It's in uh, Mecca. Where does the verse say it's in Mecca? I have no idea. Exactly. And it says Masjid al-Aqsa. Where is Masjid al-Aqsa? It's in Jerusalem. Where does the verse say Jerusalem? It doesn't. Okay, now, when you go to the Hadith, you got more problems. You know why? The Hadith why? that comes over 100 years later, let's just go with it, says that your prophet was taken from the Kaaba to the temple, an actual temple, Beitul Muqaddis, the temple in Jerusalem, and he entered inside the door and he led the prophets in prayer. And Burak was tied to the door. Historically, this is a fact. There was no temple in Jerusalem in the 7th century. The temple of Solomon was destroyed in 586 BC. And the second temple was destroyed in 70 AD. But your hadith say he went to the temple and entered the temple. Burak was tied to the door, led the prophets in prayer, came out, and then went through the seven heavens. How could he go to a temple that did not exist? This is a fact of history. Don't take my word for it. Now you got more problems with this verse. I'm not done yet. More problems. You, you ready for the other problems? It said, glorified be he who took his servant by night. Now, my question is, is this Allah speaking? Yes. So Allah is praising himself. Allah is saying, glorified be he. In other words, saying, glorified be me. I don't understand this. Say it again. 
I don't understand this. Yeah, hardly anybody does. That's the real miracle of the Quran. The real miracle is that hardly anyone can understand it. Glorified be he. But then it gets worse. Who took his servant by night from Masjid al-Haram to Masjid al-Aqsa so that we might show him some of our signs whose precincts we bless. I'm sorry. So, whose precincts we bless, bless. So we might show him some of our signs. So you're saying Allah is speaking. So Allah says to himself, glorify be him, which is me, so that we can show him some of our signs, precincts we bless, and that's Allah, right? Show who? Show him some of our signs, right? Yeah. Okay, now here's the problem. I want to ask you a question. It says, so that we, that's Allah speaking, show him some of our signs, right? That's right. Then it says he is the what? The hearing, the seeing. Okay, now I'm confused. It says, so we show him some of our signs. He, that's the him that they showed their signs to. He is the hearing and seeing? If it's Allah, why are they showing Allah their signs? I thought it is Allah. Allah showing himself signs? If it's Muhammad, how do you end up saying Muhammad is the hearing and the seeing? Can you explain that? Uh, 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 I can't. All right. Yeah, if I was going to give you another one, but it's too much for tonight. I want you to think about it. Go rewatch our sessions. Re rewatch them. Don't watch them one time. You got all the articles in the comment section. You owe it to yourself to read them. And then we can talk sometime this week. Hopefully I get better by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And tomorrow I'll be on my way home. By Thursday I'll be free to do more Skype. So I want to leave you with that. I want to overwhelm you. So I hope God's Spirit uses us to convict you and wake you up. Especially when you see your sister. Tell yourself, how in the world can I believe this? I would die for my sister. She's innocent. Like me, I would kill and die for my daughters. They're innocent. I would never allow a 54-year-old man to sleep with my, my, my oldest daughter is 11. I wouldn't even let him marry her at 11, let alone at 9. My youngest one's going to be 9. You'd have to murder me to get to them. But anyway, may the Lord Jesus convict you and the Holy Spirit haunt you in a good way to bring you to the feet of Jesus. So you can be a son of God and God your spiritual father. Anyway, we'll talk more this week, all right? Sure. Take care, buddy. Good, bye. Peace of Jesus with you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. That's right. Even though you're not supposed to wait to me, that's okay. But I'm sure you were hearing that I'm kind of sick, right? Yeah, my sheikh, my sheikh told me not to, not to greet salam to the kuffar. Yeah, exactly, because you can't do that. It says when they greet yeah. you, you can say alaikum. But that's fine. You wanted to talk about Muhammad in the Bible, right? Yeah, that's right. Go ahead, buddy. Okay, so I found a passage. Uh, Deuteronomy 33, yep. verses 1 to 2. Yeah. Yes, um, sh yeah, should I read it? Or? Yeah, and uh, do you have the Bible open? If you can, it'll be easier. If not, I'll read I know that it comes from Sierra, right? From yeah, Sierra, I, have the, Sierra, from. I have a Bible gateway open. You have it or yeah, you want so, me to read it? Yeah, I have a Bible gateway open. Okay, use it. So it says, this is the blessing that Moses, the man of God, pronounced on the Israelites before his death. He said, the Lord came from Sinai and dawned over them from Sam. He showed forth from Mount Paran, he came with myriads of holy ones from the south, from his mountain slopes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm aware of this. So you're saying Quran is Islam, right? Yes. See, the Lord came from Sinai. Sinai is a place in Egypt. Mm -hmm. That's where Moses is from. And he dawned over them from Seir. Seir is a place in Palestine. It's a mountain in Palestine. Yeah. And that's where Jesus, alayhi salam, is from. Mm -hmm. And there's a third one. He shone forth from Mount Aran, and this is where this is the prophecy of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Yeah, I'm aware of that. So, but here's the problem. Number one, you have to first show that Sierra is referring to Jesus. What's the proof? Sierra is a mount in Palestine. Yeah, the land of the proof it's about Jesus. It's gospel. 
Uh, no, I can't. That's the the name. Mount, uh, sorry, the name Sam is referring to Palestine, and Jesus was born in Palestine. Yeah, what I'm saying is prove that that's referring to Jesus coming with the gospel, because you're saying Sinai is the law of Moses, Sierra is about the gospel of Jesus, and and then Quran will be about the uh, Quran and Muhammad. So first of all. Prove that Sierra is referring to the Messiah. What source can you show me? What source can you point to to show that Sierra is about Jesus? That's the first question. Yeah, all I have is that some commentators of the Old Testament said that Seir is the mountain land of the Edomites to the east of Sinai. So it's what? Uh, some of the commentators of the Old Testament, they yep. say that Seir is the mountain land of the Edomites. To and the, the Edomites are the descendants of Esau. It has nothing to do with Jesus. Yeah, I can't I can't prove like explicitly yep. it's about Jesus. Secondly, what proof do you have that Quran is Mecca? I know you assume it, but prove it. Because go to Numbers <laughs> 10, open up your Bible, read Numbers 10, 11 to 13. Numbers 10, 11 to 13. Okay, inshallah. Yep. Okay. On the 20th day of the second month of the second year, the cloud lifted above the tabernacle of the covenant law. Then the Israelites set out from the desert of Sinai and traveled from place to place until the cloud came to rest in the desert of Paran. They set out this first time as the Lord's command through Moses. So are you saying that the Israelites went to Mecca? Because yes. it says here, it says that, yeah. the Israelites set out from the desert. desert of Sinai to the desert of Paran. So they went to Mecca? Yes, they did. Prove it. Okay, so just give me a second, Charlie. Okay, so there's a commentary by uh, Clark. He says that this part, the desert of Paran, belongs to the Arabia Pet Petra. Petra. And Petra is and, not Mecca. Oh. Petra is actually proving the point of Jay Smith, and it's also proving the point of uh, Dan Gibson that the origins of Islam is in Petra to the north of Mecca. Okay, I have another commentator. A Strong's Bible Dictionary. Sure. He says, Paran is a desert of Arabia. Okay, so when you say desert of Arabia, Arabia is a huge place. All right. So when you say it's a desert of Arabia, you need to show that it's specifically Mecca. And why did they go there? What was the purpose of going there? Yes. Okay. So I have, <clears throat> I don't know exactly why they go uh, went there. Yeah. Maybe it's for Hajj. The Israelites probably did Hajj. So how come there is no reference in the Bible, the Old Testament, to Hajj to Mecca? And no reference to the Kaaba in the Old Testament, and no reference to the rites of pilgrimage in the Kaaba if they went there. Can you show me that in the Old Testament? The, the Kaaba is mentioned in Psalm 84. Yeah, no, it's not. It talks about Becca, which is balsam trees, and it's a location on your way to Jerusalem. In fact, my challenge to you is prove that Becca is Mecca. I know where you're getting it from in chapter 3, <laughs> verse 96. Quran. But prove yeah, Becca is Mecca. Quran. Okay. I'll just, okay, give me one second, inshallah. Proof Mecca is Mecca. Psalm 84, 5 to 6. Okay, so Mecca, Mecca with a B, it's used in the Quran in 396. I know, I Bekka, told you that. I said 396. Bekka, I told yeah, you 396. Bekka. But prove to me Mecca in the Quran is Mecca. Where'd you get that from? Prove to me from Quran 396 that Mecca yeah. is Mecca. Yeah, but in 4824, it uses Mecca with an M. It doesn't Chicago use Mecca there in 396. It's Becca. So I'm asking you, prove to me that when the Quran mentions Becca in 396, that's Mecca. Prove it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because in 4824, Quran 4824, it says Mecca with an M. A little louder, Mecca we can't hear you. An a little louder, we can't hear you. Your voice and mic is not too clear. Okay. In, in Quran 4824, 
It says Mecca with an M. You're not getting it. I know Mecca with an M. But what's the proof that Mecca is Becca? If I mention Chicago and I mention Los Angeles, doesn't mean Los Angeles is Chicago. Okay. Uh, do you want – is there, is there – um, A little louder because your that, mic is not too clear. I, I don't know why. What's going on? Yeah, is that proof of Mecca and Mecca in outside of the Quran, like in Hadiths? So you're you're going to go to Hadiths that are 200 years later, but you can't show me from the Quran, or you can't show me from the Old Testament, and you can't show me from archaeology. So can you show me any proof that Abraham and Ishmael went to Mecca and built the Kaaba? Don't show it to me from the Hadith, because you can't show in the Quran. The Quran doesn't tell you where they built the house. Okay, but the Quran, uh, the Hadiths, we use authentic Hadiths. So the authentic Hadiths, which are 200 years later, tell you that <clears throat> Bakka is Mecca, show it to me. Even though uh, it's not they... my witness and testimony. <coughs> so I'm still waiting from the Bible where Quran is Mecca. You showed me it's Petra. Petra is to the north. And that confirms the theories of Dan Gibson and Jay Smith. But I want to show you some more verses. Genesis 14, verses 5 to 7. Genesis 14, verse 5. To, I'll read it for you. Okay? Okay. In the 14th year, Kador Laomar and the kings allied with him went out and defeated the Raphaites. Raphaites. Ugh. And Asheroth, Karnaim, the Zuzites and Ham, the Emites and Shaba, Kiriathaim, and the Horites in the hill country of Seir, as far as El Paran near the desert. So the people in Seir are Horites, not Ishmaelites. And these Horites were there as far as El Paran, the desert. Where does it say Ishmaelites? It doesn't, it doesn't say Ishmaelites here. Okay, let me read a couple more. Numbers 12, 15 and 16. So Miriam was confined outside the camp for seven days, and the people did not move on till she was brought back. After that, the people left Hazaroth and encamped in the desert of Paran. So you want us to believe they journeyed hundreds of miles to Mecca. Well, then where is the desert of Paran? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. You're thinking it's Mecca. Paran's not Mecca. That's my whole point. And if you go to yeah, the Hadith... Where, I'm asking you, where is it on the map? Where is it? Paran is near Egypt, Iraq, and Canaan. Get any good Bible map, and I'll tell you that. But more than that, if you're going to go to the Hadith, then the Bible's going to be your enemy because the Hadith say Ishmael married a woman from Jurhim, right? I think so, yeah. Yeah, that says that. Uh, Jurham tribe in Mecca, he married, and then divorced and married another woman from Jurham. But in Genesis 21, yeah. 21, it says, Ishmael was in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother, who's Egyptian, went to Egypt and got him a wife, because Paran is near Egypt. And he married an Egyptian, not an Arab. So how does this prove your yeah. point? Yeah, but this, this part is corrupt. See, that's my point. Any passage that refutes you is corrupt. So why even waste your time on the Bible? I'm just showing that it could be it could be a proof of Islam. It could prove Muhammad. Well, I mean, to you if you want to believe that, but not to us who read it in context. And then on top of that, Deuteronomy 33, 2, it says, The Lord came from Sinai, Sierra, and then to Pran with myriads of holy ones, right? Yes. So who are the myriads of holy ones that accompany Jesus in Seir? Because you're saying Seir is about Jesus. Um, no. Uh, it, the myriads of holy ones is talking about the Mount Paran, the people of Mount Paran. Where is it limited to Mount Paran? It's talking about those three locations and the Lord coming with myriads. Yeah, when I read that part, I thought of 
Prophet Muhammad. You got to you got to fix your mic. It's not doing too good. Your sound is not too good. Yeah, when I read that part, I thought of Muhammad and the ten thousand of Muslims he brought to uh, so, to conquer Mecca. Even if you say it's ten thousand, that's fine. Some reports say twelve thousand, but that's okay. I don't care about that. But it also says that he came with variants to Sierra. So when did Jesus come with ten thousand? No, Jesus. Jesus didn't fight anybody. Jesus what? Jesus didn't fight anybody. Yeah, but the passage says the Lord came with his myriads in these three places, not just Paran. Okay, yeah, yeah, I see it. So when did Jesus come with 10,000? No, he didn't come with 10,000. Yeah, so that passage got to go out the window. What else do you have? Okay, yeah, another one I have. This one, subhanAllah, I thought of Muhammad. Uh, this one is Isaiah 42. Yeah. 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 So the first verse of Isaiah 42, it says, Here is my servant. And Muhammad is known as Allah's servant. In Arabic, his name is Abdullah. He's so Allah only has Allah. one servant? So the rest of the prophets are not his servants? It's only Muhammad? I, <laughs> I, they're all servants, but this is a special name. He but in chapter 19, verse this. 30, your Quran quotes Isa saying he is Abdullah and a prophet. Oh, go to chapter 19, yeah, 19 sure. verse 30. See what Isa says as a baby, supposedly, but you believe it. Yeah, yeah. he said, Surely I'm a servant of Allah. He has given me the book and made me a prophet. So, Muhammad is the only servant, huh? Forget everyone else. <laughs> okay, okay, let me keep going. Okay, sure, keep going. It says, yeah, it says, I will put my spirit, spirit, and in Hebrew, that's ruach, yep. ruach, on him. And the spirit here refers to angels, because Zechariah 6, 5, in Zechariah 6, yeah. 5, it says the spirits are, uh, the spirit is angels. Yeah, angels. can you show me where the spirit was on Muhammad? Uh, no, the, but uh, the spirit, uh, uh, the spirit gave Muhammad the Quran. No, what I'm asking you is, it doesn't say gave him the Quran. It says, I will put my spirit on him. He'll be on him, not he'll give him something. So can you show me where Gabriel came on Muhammad and remained on yeah, Muhammad? So, yeah, um, chapter 6, Surah 16, verse 102. No, that doesn't say he came on him. It says he revealed to him the revelation. That's not what I'm asking. The verse says came on him. Rested on him. So where did the spirit rest on him? Because in the Gospels, the spirit of God rested on Jesus. Matthew 3, 17, 16, I'm sorry. Matthew 3, 16, Mark 1, 10, Luke 3, 22, and John 1, 32, 33. It says the Holy Spirit came down in bodily shape like a dove and remained on him, Jesus. And then Matthew 12, 17 to 21, we are told there. That Jesus fulfilled Isaiah 42 verses 1 to 4. Matthew even quotes it about Jesus. So can you show me where the spirit rested on Muhammad like it rested on Jesus? No, I don't think I can show you. So why are you quoting a verse that says the spirit will rest on him, not give him revelation to connect Muhammad when in the New Testament, God's spirit, the Father's spirit rested on Jesus? Okay, so this this prophecy is about Jesus, alayhi salam. Yep. Okay. Um, yeah, let me just keep going. Okay. Yep. It says, yeah, and um, it says he will bring justice in Hebrew. The the word is mishpat. He will bring justice to the nations, and uh, it says justice to the nations, not just the Israelites, mm -hmm. but the prophets, the Israelite prophets, never preach to the non-Israelites. But Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he brought judgment to the whole world. Not but just not according to your Quran. Jesus also was for the world. No, Go to 1921 of the Quran. Go to 1921 of the Quran. 1921? Yep. Okay, he said, even so, your Lord says, it is easy to me, and that we may make him a sign to the men, 
and a mercy from us. And it is a matter which has been decreed. Is a sign for who? To men. Men. And the word is alamin. And then I'm going to show. I'm sorry. It's nas. And then I'm going to show you. It's uh, the word alamin. Same language used of your prophet. And he's a mercy. Now go to 2191. Surah Al-Anbiya. 2191. 20. Okay. Inshallah. Okay. And she who guarded her chastity. So we breathed into her our inspiration and made her. And her son, a sign for the nations. Oh, wait, nations. Well, interesting. <laughs> now, go to chapter 3 of the Quran, verses 3 and 4. Chapter what? Sorry. 3, Surah al Imran, chapter 3, verses 3 and okay. 4. Okay. Uh, aforetime, our guidance for the people, he sent the fourth Khan, surely they who disbelieve in the communications of Allah. They shall have a severe chastisement. And Allah is mighty. The Lord You're not reading chapter 3, oh. verses 3 and 4. Chapter 3, verse oh. 3 and 4. Oh, okay. So forgive me. That's okay. Okay. <clears throat> he has revealed to you the book with truth, verifying that which is before it. And he revealed the Torah. And the Injil of war time, a guidance for the people, and he sent the Khan. Surely they who disbelieve in the communications yeah, of you Allah. went too far. It's okay. <laughs> so the Torah and the gospel, a guidance for who? For for the Jews and Christians. No, does it, well, yeah, you Christians because they're not just Jews, but still, what's the word that it says? What's the word? A guidance for who? For the people. People. Now, the same language is used of your Quran in chapter 2, verse 185. Chapter 2, verse 185 says, your, The Quran was sent down in Ramadan as a guidance for the people. Same language. Chapter 2, verse 185. Yeah, yeah, it, it is. Yeah. Okay, so the Quran doesn't agree with you that Jesus is only for the Israelites. And the Hadiths don't agree with you. Okay, but Sam, didn't the Quran say that Jesus came to the children of the Israelites? And Muhammad came to the Arab, spoke in Arabic. He didn't go to Africa and spoke Swahili, right? <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Just because Jesus went to the Israelites, that's true, but it doesn't mean his message won't be for the nations after he goes to the Israelites. Just like your prophet came to the Arabs and he spoke Arabic, but then they took the message all over the world. That's what happened with Jesus' disciples. That's exactly what there's a tradition. That's what he said. But if, okay, but if Jesus was for the whole world, then why would his message get corrupted? <laughs> Who told you it's corrupted? You keep thinking it's corrupted. Okay. Yes. And you're using the Bible, a corrupt book, to prove your uncorrupt Quran. Does that make sense? No, I'm not using the whole Bible. I'm using parts of it. Yeah, but then you have to use the Quran to determine which parts are not corrupt, which is circular reasoning. See, this part I accept agrees with the Quran, but I didn't know the Quran is true. Oh, because the Bible prophesied Muhammad. See the logic? Yeah, but that's what uh, Sheikh told us. He's, they said the, uh, all the parts that agree with Quran are authentic. The parts that don't agree are false. Okay, then if I say, well, how do I know the Quran is true? You'll tell me, well, because... Muhammad is prophesied in the Bible. But the same Bible that contradicts Quran? Oh, yeah, but those parts are corrupt. Okay, but Sam, like, uh, Allah sends prophets, and he sent Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So why would Islam be to nearly 2 billion people? What, Allah? The, well, I mean, uh, like, if you think that's the case for the truth of Islam, then you're proving Christianity sure. Why is Allah allowing Christianity to spread? Christianity spread by the sword. Really? And Muhammad spread by tulips and roses. We spread. <laughs> yeah, when, when he said yeah. Omar and Uthman and Ali and Khalid ibn Walid to attack Jerusalem and Syria and Persia, it wasn't a sword. It was tulips and roses. But then My today, brother. what do you do with the fact in Africa, 
you have hundreds of thousands of Muslims becoming Christian in Africa and Iran. There are thousands of Iranians becoming Christian. Why is Allah allowing Christianity spread in Muslim countries? According to you. Allah knows best. Okay. Then you answered your own question. And not only that, when you say two million Muslims, you don't agree all of them are Muslims. Do you agree that Afida are Muslims? No. So, but that's part of the two million that you mentioned. Do you agree that the Alawi are Muslims? No, no. That, but that's part of the two million some... that you're mentioning. Yeah, yeah. But I believe like they're Muslims, but they're deviant. You know what I mean? So, but like she is. So, but you're saying they're not Muslims, are they, or they're deviant, like the Ahmadiyya? Yeah, they're deviant. They're not, okay. They're not pure so, Muslims. don't count them as two million Muslims. Because many of those Muslims, you consider them to be munafiq, munafiqeen, they're hypocrites. And that's why you have ICE, Al-Qaeda, Boko Haram killing these Muslims because they don't consider them Muslims. Killing the Shia, beheading the Shia. So when Muslims tell me, oh, too many Muslims, they're being dishonest because they don't include every group as Islam. So why are you including them yeah. in that list? Yeah, but majority were all Sunnis, like majority of us. What majority? Uh, because you're a Salafi or you're, you're Ashari, right? Uh, no, I'm Salaf. Okay, so when the Ashari, Ashaira, when they say that Allah's hand isn't an actual hand, they do ta'wil, they allegorize it. No, are they committing? It's an actual hand. It's just beyond our comprehension. Okay, but they don't say it's hand. They say it's a metaphor for Allah's power. You say no, no it's no, Allah's no, hand. No. We don't make ta'wil. We don't allegorize it. Yeah, it's real. Uh, Allah has hands and he has a face. Okay, so that's my point. Even the Ashaira or the Maturidi, these Muslims, you have problems with their aqidah. Yeah. So you're including people that you have problems with because if someone becomes Ashaira, if he becomes an Ashari, you'd say, no, no, brother, you need to become, you need to follow the Salaf Asalih, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that means you have a problem with every Muslim. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Okay, keep asking me. What else you have? Yeah, I was saying that um, that uh, the Isaiah forty two one it says uh, Mishpat. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah, it says it's will bring justice to the nations, and that's a professor of Hebrew. I can quote uh, Christopher. Can you quote that yeah. professor saying it's speaking of an Arab prophet to come? Yeah, 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 hold on. It says that the he says the word mishpa is used absolutely, and it has the comprehensive sense of the Islamic deen, which embraces both faith and practice. So who, this Jewish guy Islam. says it's Islamic deen. Yeah, let me let me quote. Yeah, quote it for me. I want to see what he says. Quote it. Let's see. All right, inshallah. Yeah, let's see. Because uh, I'd be shocked if a Jewish guy who believes the Old Testament would say that, but let's see. Okay, uh, this is, I'm quoting him exactly, okay? You're quoting what? Professor of, I'm quoting Christopher North, a professor of Hebrew. Okay. He stated in his, he stated in his commentary on Isaiah 42, 1, that, quote, most commentators remark that Mishpat is here used absolutely without the article and that it, is, it has the comprehensive sense of the Islamic deen okay. judgment. Give me the page number of the book and what he says before and after because I know you're quoting from a website that's quoting out of context. What did he say before that and after that? Yeah, I'm quoting from a Muslim website. Yeah, exactly. Say it again. Who would you quote? A Muslim website. So you went by a Muslim website, but you can't tell me what he said before and after. So I can see if he says, though the Islamic law could fall under the category of Mishpah, still Isaiah 42 is not about Muhammad, it's about Israel. So I want to see no, this, what he says in the context. This brother, yeah, this brother, he's good. At he's what? Islam. I said this brother is good at proving Islam. He can be good all he wants. I want to know what that scholar said before and after, because contextually it's not about an error. That's the whole point. So though okay. he can say Mishpah, can, in a broader sense, refer to Islamic law. Contextually, it's not about an Arab or an Ishmaelite 
It's about the nation of Israel. So I want to see what he said before and after. Give me the context. Okay. Yeah, just give me like one second. Okay. Go ahead. Read before and after. Okay, it's um, it's an actual book. Like I don't have. I know it's a book. It. Uh, that's why I want to know what he wrote before and after. So you went to a Muslim website. You trusted what this Muslim told you by taking a citation out of context. And I bet you if I read in context, he doesn't say it's Muhammad, which I will do. I'll find it. But anyway, that's not going to prove. Okay, the, book, that, yeah, the book is called The Second Isaiah. Yeah, it's by Christ the Second Isaiah, which is proof of what I'm saying. He's a liberal who thinks that this is a section not written by the prophet Isaiah. So you're proving my point. He doesn't think it's Muhammad. He's a liberal who thinks that this section of Isaiah is not prophetic. It's written by some individuals that attribute it to Isaiah. But hold on, can I ask you a question then? Okay, yeah, go ahead. Here's my question. The question I want to ask is, he doesn't believe this is a prophetic statement. He doesn't believe Isaiah wrote this, the prophet. He doesn't believe it's prophecy. So are you telling me non-prophets, Someone who's not a prophet prophesied Muhammad? Go ahead, yeah. So yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, keep reading Isaiah 42. No, no, you had a question for me. Yeah. He, this man doesn't believe Isaiah wrote that section. That's why he said second Isaiah. Second Isaiah, meaning it is a section written by people after the Jews came from Babylon. It wasn't written by the prophet Isaiah. How can people who are not prophets prophesy Muhammad? They're not prophets. They don't receive wahi. So you'd agree with him? No, but that's what he believes. That's why he called it second Isaiah. Second Isaiah means that he doesn't believe Isaiah wrote it. He believes Isaiah wrote chapters one to 39, but chapters 40 to 55 was written by a Jew or some Jews after they returned from Babylon in the sixth century. And they added it to Isaiah. So it's not prophetic. It's not Wahi. It's not the words of a prophet. Why are you quoting him? He doesn't think it's prophetic. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I so, do you agree that. with him? It's not prophetic. It's not a prophecy. No, no I don't agree with him. So, why I you quote a guy a that prophecy. thinks it's not a prophecy? Yeah, I just thought it helped my case. Yeah, didn't help too much, did it? <laughs> no, I got started. All right. So, what's next? Okay. Uh, let's give me a second. Yeah, so verse 11, it explicitly mentions Kedar and Salah. Yeah. And, sorry, Salah. Yeah, yeah. Salah. So Ke Can Ke you prove that Muhammad yeah, is Ke from Kedar? Yeah, okay. Prove it. So Kedar is one of the sons of Ishmael. I know. Prove it's that Muhammad is a son of Kedar. Yeah, okay. I have an article where I quote Ibn Kathir, Ibn Ishaq. And they say that anyone who seeks to, tr to trace your prophet's genealogy, Ishmael, is a liar. And they were not in agreement. Some said he's a son of Kedar. Others said he's a son of Nebuchadnezzar. So can you prove he's a son of Kedar? Yeah, from the Sirah of the Prophet, Tabakat, even so. No, I have the Sirah. He doesn't say that. Read it. He says that some say Kedar, some say Nebawith. No, Tabakat, even Saad. Here, let me read it for you because you see, you're saying no, and I'm telling you, I quote them. Here you go, hold on. Here you go. Here you go. Ibn Kathir. All right. Al Sirah al Nabawiya. <clears throat> Let me see. Volume 1, pages 50, 52. Let me read to you what he says. And I want to read to you Ibn Sa'ad. That's Tabakat that you're quoting to me. Ibn Sa'ad. Okay, now, are you ready? I want to read for you. Okay, go ahead. There is no question of Adnan being of the line of Ishmael, son of Abraham, upon both of whom be peace. Well, there is a question. You've got to prove it. But anyway, what dispute there is relates to the number of forebearers that were from Adnan to Ishmael, according to the various sources. At one of the end of the spectrum, there is the extreme view that considers there to have been 40. This is the view of Christians and Jews who adopted it from the writings of Achia, the clerk of Armia, Jeremy bin Halqiya, as we will relate. Some authorities maintain there are 30, others 20, yet more 15, 10, 9, or 7. Now let me skip to read what he says here. 
This is why Malik, God bless him, did not enthuse over the attempt at tracing genealogy back to before Adnan. As for Malik, God have mercy on him, he expressed disapproval when asked about someone tracing his descent back to Adam and commented, whence comes to him knowledge of that? Where does he get this knowledge from? When he was asked about tracing back to Ishmael, he expressed similar disapproval, asking, who could provide such an information? Malik also disliked Tracing the genealogy of the prophets, just as saying Abraham, son of so and so, and El Al Muyatti stated this in his book. El Suhaili commented also that Malik's viewpoint was analogous to what was related of Urwa bin El Zubair, who is reported to have said, We have found no one who knows the line between Adnan and Ishmael. Did you hear it? No one who knows the line. <laughs> between Adnan and Ishmael. You caught it? No one. Yeah, I got it. Okay, but I got more for you because I want to read Ibn Sa'd. Okay, okay, let me read Ibn Sa'd. Hold on, but let me finish it. Omar. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me, I skipped. Okay. It is reported that Ibn Abbas said between Adnan and Ishmael, there were 30 ancestors who are unknown. <laughs> unknown. Ibn Abbas is also report, reputed to have said, when he traced back lines of descent as far as Adnan, the genealogists have lied twice or thrice. And that skepticism is even more characteristic of Ibn Masood. These are all the Sahaba of your prophet, whose attitude was like that yeah. of Ibn Abbas. Omar bin al-Khattab stated, we carry back the genealogy only as far as Adnan. Okay. Abu Umar bin Abdul Bar stated in his book Al An Anbafi Marafat Kabil Al Ruwah, right? That Ibn Lahya related from Abu Al Aswad that he heard Urwa bin Al Zubair say, "We never found anyone who knew. We never found anyone who knew genealogy back past Adnan, nor past Kahdan, unless they were using conjecture." Abu al-Aswad stated that he had heard Abu Bakr Sulaiman bin Abu Khaytham, one of the very most knowledgeable men of the poetry and the genealogy of Croatia, say, we never knew anyone with information going back to beyond Ma'ad bin Adnan, whether relating poetry or other knowledge. One more line, and I can read Ibn Sa'd if you want. Abu Umar said that there was a group of the predecessors, including Abdullah bin Masood, Amr bin Maymun al-Azdi and Muhammad bin Kaab al-Quraidi, who when they recited the verse from the Quran and those after them who no one but God knows, would comment, the genealogists lied. Now, do you want me to read Ibn Sa'd, Tabakat? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, here you go. Here's Ibn Sa'd. He, on the authority of Ibn Abbas, he said, verily the prophet, whenever he read his gene genealogy, did not go beyond Ma'ad ibn Adnan ibn Udad. Then he kept quiet and said, the narrators of genealogy are liars. Since Allah says, there passed many generations between them. That's your prophet, by the way. Ibn Abbas says, yeah. the prophet would have been informed of the genealogy prior to Adnan by Allah, if he, the prophet, had so wished. He, on the authority of Abdullah, verily recited, the tribes of Ad and Thamud and those after them, none saveth Allah knoweth them. The genealogists are liars. Are liars. You want me to go on? Because here, uh, Ibn Sa'd, well, let me show you what he says. He gives you two contradictory genealogies. Guessing, he says, okay. your prophet goes to Aus bin Adam, Ibn Kedar, Kedar, Ibn Ismail. But now this one. Verily, the genealogy of Ma'ad ibn Adnan has been traced differently. In some narrations, it is Ma'ad ibn Adnan ibn Muqawwam ibn Nahur ibn Tira ibn Yarub ibn Yashjub ibn Nabit. Nabit ibn Ismail. They can't even agree. Is it Nebawith or is it Kedar? So how do you know, man? Uh, we don't know. So how are you going to prove to me Kedar is about Muhammad? No, but uh, do you agree that Qadar is related to Arabia? 
Yeah, but it's not just Arabia. If you read it, it's talking about the servant being the light of God's salvation to the isles and the ends of the earth. Why would you just read that part? Start reading from 6 all the way to 12. You're going to see he's going to be the light that brings God's salvation to the ends of the earth, to the islands, to the coastlands, yeah, that, to Kedah. That's Muhammad. Yeah, but no, that's not the Quran because you're trying to prove the prophet is from Kedah. That's not what it says. It says this man is going to bring salvation to all these places. Didn't say he's an Arab. Okay, so then who is this about? It's about Jesus, the Messiah, bringing salvation to the ends of the earth. Yeah, Jews don't agree with you. Well, can you give me some rabbis and Talmud? Quote the Talmud for me. Show me in the Talmud. Show me in the rabbinic sources that they say, this servant is an Arab who will come from Mecca. Which Jew agrees with you? Uh, I don't know. Thank you. So if you're going to go to the Jews, the Jews don't agree with you. They think it's Israel. And there are Jews who believe it's the Messiah because there are Jews who believe in Jesus. So when you say Jews don't agree with me, can you quote one rabbi? Can you quote one Jewish source, Talmud? The Targums, the Aramaic prayers phrases of the Old Testament that say, this servant is an Arab, he's from Kedar, and he'll come from Mecca? I, I don't know. I don't know if I can. So then why are you telling me no Jew agrees with me when no Jew agrees with you? <laughs> yeah. And not only that, how can Isaiah prophesy Muhammad yeah. When Muhammad contradicts Isaiah's prophecy, do you believe? Where does he contradict? Are you sure? Isaiah 63, yeah, 16. Can you read that for me? Okay. Inshallah. 63, 16. Yeah. But you are our father. Though Abraham does not know us, our Israel acknowledges you, Lord, are our father. Our redeemer from of all is your name. See, you caught it because you laughed. Isaiah said, <laughs> stuck for Allah. Say it again, stuck for Allah, right? I stuck for Allah. Lord so Isaiah Allah. says, God is their father. Your prophet says, Allah is not their father, and he's not your father. So, so, so father is, uh, is son of God used in the Old Testament? Can I can't hear you because your mic is very bad, man. Yeah, can you show me from the Old Testament that Jesus is the Son of God? Go to Proverbs 30, verses 3 and 4. Proverbs 30, verses 3 and 4. I have not learned wisdom, nor have I attained to the knowledge of the Holy One. Who has gone up to heaven and come down? Whose hands have gathered up the wind? <clears throat> Who has wrapped up the waters in a cloak? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? And what is the name of, of, of his son? So you laughed again. Sure, you know. <laughs> but you're quoting the Old Testament. What the stuck for Allah? The Old Testament agrees with New Testament against the Quran. And there are so many Jews that don't accept Jesus. Like Islam. What Jews? There are thousands of Jews that accept Jesus. What are you talking about? No, there isn't. Jews don't accept. Messianic. You want to bet? There's Messianic Jews, Hebrew Christians. Michael Brown is a Jew who believes in Jesus, and he debates rabbis. What are you talking about? Oh, okay. So, <laughs> okay. So how can Isaiah predict Muhammad when Isaiah contradicts Muhammad's theology in the Quran? I don't know. Maybe this part is Quran. So then stop quoting it. Why are you quoting a corrupt book to prove your prophet, man? Yeah. Now go to Matthew 12. Go to Matthew 12, 15 to 17 to see who fulfills Isaiah 42. No, I don't want to go to Matthew 12. That's New Testament. Yeah, but I'm trying to show you, according to the Hawariyun, the disciples of Jesus, who fulfilled it, Isaiah 42, because that's what you're quoting, right? Okay, sure. So go to my, Matthew 12, 15 to uh, 20, 21. Matthew 12, 15 to 21. Okay, inshallah. 
Aware of this, Jesus withdrew from that place. A large crowd followed him, and he healed all who were ill. He warned them not to tell others about him. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. Here is my servant whom I have chosen, the one I love and whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will proclaim justice to the nations. He will not quarrel or cry out. And no one will hear his voice in the streets. This is Isaiah 42. Thank you. And it says Jesus fulfilled it. And in his name shall the Gentiles trust. And it said the spirit will be on him, right? Go to Matthew 3, 16 and 17. Read that for me. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened up. And he saw the Spirit of God like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my son, Astaghfirullah, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. So the Holy Spirit actually did come down on Jesus in visible shape like a dove. And God said, This is my son whom I love. Nowhere in the Quran does it say the Spirit came down on Muhammad, rested on him. But did you know that your Quran says, the Holy Spirit did strengthen Jesus and come with him and assist him. Your Quran agrees with that? Yeah, Jesus was uh, strengthened by the Holy Spirit. So that means the, the Quran agrees with the Bible. Jesus is the servant of Isaiah 42. Oh. <laughs> right? That's chapter 2 of the Quran, verse 87. Chapter 2, verse 253. And chapter 5, verse 110. Chapter 2, verse 87, chapter 2, verse 253, chapter 5, verse 110, it says, Jesus was strengthened with the Holy Spirit, something not said about your prophet. So agreeing with the New Testament, Jesus is the servant of Isaiah 42. Yeah. Okay. Isaiah 42, verse 2. So do you think you want to give up using the Bible? It's not going to help you, man. Yeah, I, I don't think... This, the, yeah, there's no way the Quran affirms this book. This book well, we so. can talk about next session. What does the Quran say about the Bible? I've done discussions. Does the Quran say it's corrupt? We can talk about that, but not today because today was about prophecy. Yeah, yeah, we can talk about that, inshallah. Yeah, so do you have any more, or do you think, you know what, I can't use this book? This book is a nightmare. Yeah, I can't use this book. This is good for a long time. So right. much blast. Okay, you keep saying it's blasphemy, but the Old Testament and New Testament agree with each other. This is why Jews and Christians see the Quran as blasphemy, because it contradicts the Bible. But that's okay. Let me know when you want to talk about what the Quran says about the Bible. Contact me this week. We'll talk about it. Okay, can I uh, bring a final point? Sure. Yeah, so last time, uh, yesterday you showed me verses from John showing the, the divinity of Christ, right? Yep. And I... I agree, like Jesus is God there. Yeah. But I read, I read some scholars who say that John is the, the last gospel, and these things, these things about Jesus were like developing from the early yeah, gospels, which too. were like Mark, Matthew, Luke. Yeah. So over time, this is clear okay. So kind of what, okay. So if I okay. if I show you from the gospels Jesus claiming to be God, in fact, I'm going to show you something. Adith Kutsi. That's going to blow you away. You ready? Okay, show me. Okay, because it's not just John. But still, that means John does teach Jesus as God, so we have to say it's corrupt. Exactly what you say. That's what the scholars are saying. So they're saying what you're saying. Same thing. But I'm going to show you a Hadith Qudsi. I'm going to give you the link, and I'll read it. And then let me just get it for you. Hold on, sunnah.com. Sunnah.com. Let's go here. Hadith Qudsi number 8. 18, I'm sorry. Hadith Qudsi number 18. Okay, here you go. I'm going to give you the link. All right? Let me get you the link. And uh, I'll read it for you. You tell me who Jesus claims to be. All right? Let me okay. find you the comment section. I can't find it. Where is it? All right, here, all right. here you go. I'm going to read. Okay, let's read. Hadith Qudsi, number 18. On the authority of Abu Huraira, may Allah be pleased with him, who said that the Messenger of Allah said, 
Allah, mighty and sublime, be he, will say on the day of resurrection, O son of Adam, I fell ill, and you visited me not. He will say, O Lord, and how should I visit you when you are the Lord of the worlds? He will say, did you not know that my servant so-and-so had fallen ill, and you visited him not? Did you not know that had you visited him, you would have found me with him? O son of Adam, I asked you for food, and you fed me not. So Allah is saying, you didn't feed me. So Allah wants to eat, but you didn't feed him. But now watch. He will say, O Lord, and how should I feed you when you are the Lord of the worlds? He will say, did you not know that my servant so-and-so asked you for food, and you fed him not? Did you not know that had you fed him, you would surely have found that, the reward for doing so with me. Now, that's not in the Arabic. They added in parentheses. O son of Adam, I asked you to give me to drink, and you gave me not to drink. He will say, O Lord, how should I give you to drink when you are the Lord of the worlds? He will say, my servant so-and-so asked you to give him to drink, and you give him not to drink. Had you given him to drink, you would have surely found that with me. It was rated by Muslim. You got that, right? Okay, now let me show you what Jesus says. You ready? 700 years before Muhammad. Here's what Jesus says. Matthew 25, 31 and 46. Okay? I'm going to read it for you. Matthew okay, go okay, 25, 31 to 46. Pay attention. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, this is Jesus speaking, and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. Can a prophet say he comes in glory, sitting on a throne of glory with angels? No. Okay, let's so read. Long. Watch what Jesus says. It's still We're not done yet. All the nations will be gathered before him, him the Son of Man. This is Jesus speaking. And he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides the sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the king, so Jesus calls himself the king, will say to those on his right hand. So on the day of resurrection, he's the king who judges all the nations. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, come you, blessed of my father. Oh, Jesus, the son of man, is the son of God, and he's the king of that day. Melek Yom Adin. Give a watch. Yeah, see? <clears throat> yeah, you're laughing, but come, you blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, wow. Jesus says, on that day, they'll call him Rab, Lord. He's Menach Yom Adin. Wow. Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king, Jesus again says he's the king, my goodness, will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, but my brethren, you did it to me. Now watch, this is where Muhammad took Jesus' words and put it in Allah's mouth. Watch this. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer him, saying, Lord, Rab, you are the Rab. Malik Yom Adin, the Rab. When did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So Jesus said, he's a son of God. He is the Lord of that day. He is Melek Yom Adin. He is the master, the king of that day. He is the son of man. He comes with the angels. He sits on a throne of glory. And he's going to say, you fed me when you fed one of my brothers. You didn't feed me when you didn't feed one of my brothers. But according to Muhammad, Allah says that on the day of resurrection. So who is Jesus claiming to be? 
He's claiming to be Allah. Say it again. He's claiming to be Allah. So that's Matthew. You just admit Jesus claimed to be Allah, God Almighty. Thank you for being honest. <laughs> and that's Matthew, not John. There yeah. you go. So that's why I say, forget about the Bible. It's not your friend. What do you think? Yeah. So Lord willing, yeah. this yeah. week, if you want to talk about what the Quran says of the Bible, we will in a few days. Okay, inshallah. So thank you. We'll talk more because uh, I got to go. My daughter's going to call me. So we had a good discussion. Thank you for your questions, buddy. Keep coming. And as long as you're respectful and ask sincere questions, I'll answer. Okay. Can I ask something? Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Why are you nice to me but not other Muslims? Say it again. Why are you so nice to me but not other Muslims? Because you're very respectful. You're very kind. You don't attack. You don't say, white beater. You don't say, my God came out of a woman's vagina. You don't say. I'm from Pakistan. We don't say these things. No, Muslims have said it to me. A lot of them have. Or, my God went yeah, to the toilet. I'm, I'm... Oh, okay. Yeah, they do that. They've done it. So, when Muslims attack Christians, when Muslims attack my brothers, sisters, or attack me, or attack the Bible, mock Jesus, then I treat them as they deserve. But if you watch my debates, I've talked with Muslims. When they're respectful, I'm extra respectful because I don't want to attack you. I don't want to upset you. But when you come and say, yeah, your Bible's corrupt. Your Bible is porn. Porn Bible. And Jesus came out of a woman. And, you know, you know and then you're, what do you expect? We're going to be, oh, really? Thank you. You made my day. I'm happy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Quran says that we're not allowed to insult. The exactly. Gospel. Exactly. That chapter 6 was one way. And I tell Muslims. I said, can you follow your Quran? It says, don't make their gods, lest in their ignorance they attack Allah. So can you stop making fun? They don't care because it's not about Islam for them. That's their pride and ego. They just want to attack and make fun and humiliate. But those true Muslims who, who want to fear Allah, they won't mock. They will be respectful. But when you have saying, your Bible's corrupt, it's full of porn, look at it. Then, of course, I'm not going to be nice to you. But you've been respectful. That's why I never attacked you. Because you can ask as many questions as long as you don't mock or blast me attack. I have no reason to attack you. Yeah. So, but good, good, good questions. Keep searching. Keep seeking. Keep praying. Yes, inshallah. Okay, buddy. Yeah. Yeah. May Allah guide us all. Amen. May God guide us all to the truth. Because we don't want to go to hell. We want to live forever in the presence of God. Filled with his love, joy, and peace. So may God, God, God us all. I mean, Take care, buddy. Yeah, I so. Oh, sorry. Oh, man, sorry. I didn't mean to do that. Sorry. I clo uh, hold on. Sorry, that was too fast. Sorry, man. I didn't mean to hang up that fast. I apologize. Oh, I just said salam alaikum. Alaikum salam. Even though you're not supposed to say it to me, Ya Kafir. Oh, but it's okay. Yeah. I'm not supposed to. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll talk this week. God willing. Okay. So I'm going to... Take care. Love you guys. And more importantly, Jesus loves you. Jesus is alive because he's real. Because he's alive, he will not leave us as orphans. And Jesus says, because I live, you will live also. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus.